God for his faithfulness. You cannot, you cannot quantify his faithfulness. For his greatness, for his visitation in our means. God has done so much. Yesterday you were eyewitness. You saw what the Lord did here. You saw the celebration. You saw the jumping. You saw the clapping. You saw everything. And that is why this morning, because of the joy of the Lord in your heart, you need to worship the Lord this morning because we are expecting more. We want him to do more. And that is why we need to worship the name of the Lord this morning. Our chairs are still empty. As we are about to commence or start the program, want to pray that the Lord will prepare your hearts. Pray and prepare your hearts so that you will receive everything that the Lord has have for us today. The word of God is coming. There should be a prepared heart, receptive heart. Fresh hearts, pray this morning. Commit yourself to the Lord. Prepare yourself for this morning shower. Prepare yourself that the Lord will give you understanding. As the word of God is coming forth, it will land on a very fatal heart. I want us to pray. Don't allow anything to distract you. Pray and ask the Lord so that you remain focused. Focus on the messages. Focus on the word. And so that the word of God will bear fruit in your life. We are starting this morning with Jesus, the great healer and the helper. Interceding for every individual. Want to pray this morning that message will have a great impact in your life. Want to pray that the Lord will speak to you. The reason why we are here is because of this word. We travel far and near just because of this word. Don't come here and be malingering. You allow so many things to distract your heart, distract your mind, distract your attention. No, it's time to prepare. The short time we have, prepare yourself this morning for the program of today. Especially this morning session. That, is, that the Lord will speak to you. As you listen to the word, the word of God will live too high will take you deeper, higher, and wider. Let's pray. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Commit the program of this morning session. The little foxes that spoil the vine. Those are the foxes we need to take care of this morning. 
those distractions, they are the little foxes. Those things that is taking away your attention from the word of God, they are the little foxes. Those things that are taking away your attention from the program that brought you here, they are the little foxes. Don't allow the little, little challenge around you to distract you from getting the best from the Lord. Little, little challenge around you. Little, little challenge. Food, ah, heat, all those things. Pray that the Lord will help you to get the best today. Get the best from the Lord today. We have Jesus, the just king with love and might. Want to pray that all these messages will have a great impact in your life. Let's pray and commit the servant of the Lord, the convener of the GCK, our Father in the Lord, Pastor Dr. W. Kumi, want to pray that God will use him today. God will take him to another level. Today, we surpass yesterday. The Lord will strengthen him. The Lord will empower him. The Lord will anoint him. The Lord will give him more grace, more strength. The more he prayed that the, the wonders, heaven, heaven will honor his presence here. We will see the unprecedented today. I want us to pray for all the vessels that the Lord will use, the messages this morning. I want to pray for the choirs. I want to pray for everyone that the Lord will use in the program of this this morning, let's pray for the flow of the Holy Spirit in our means. Let's pray for the touch of the Holy Spirit in our means. Let's pray that the whole of this calm will be saturated with the power of God. The whole of this calm will be saturated with the move of the Holy Spirit. That as many that has come in this meeting, one way or the other, they will be touched. They will be moved. Those who need salvation, the Holy Spirit will touch them. Those who need sanctification, the Holy Spirit will touch them. Want to pray this morning. Let there be a divine encounter. Divine encounter. Those who are passing by the road, those who are hearing us, let there be a divine encounter. Divine encounter for salvation. Divine encounter for spiritual cleansing. Divine encounter for our Christian experience. Let's pray. That the presence of God will be mighty in the program today. Starting from this morning. Let's pray that the presence of God will be mighty. Right from the pulpit to the pew. The vessel will be fresh and all the participants, the Holy Spirit will envelop us in that anointing. We want to pray against all the forces that may want to distract or make people not to receive what God has prepared for us today. Every forces around, we want to bind them. Let's pray that this environment the calm we are here is going to be a place of accident to every satanic oppression. It's going to be a place of accident to every satanic oppression. That the hand of God will be great here. His presence will be mighty. The glory of God will, will be great here. 
All negative forces will bow. Satanic activities will bow. We pray that this presence of God will take control of everything. Amen. Are you there? Amen. Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up on our feet as we take our first congregational song this morning? In our retreats, booklet, or program, page three. Our retreat program, page three. We're taking song number one there, All Things in Jesus. All Things in Jesus. Friend, all around me are trying to find what the heart yearns for. By sin undermined, I have the secrets. I know where this found. Only true pleasure in Jesus abounds. Some carry burdens whose weight has for years crushed them with sorrow and blinded with tears. Yet one stands ready to help them just now. If they will humble in patient bow, no other name thrill the joy caught within. And true, none else is remission of sin. He knows the pain of the heart, solid tried, both need and one by him be supplied. Jesus is all this poor world needs today. Blindly they strive for sin, darkness, the Darkness their way, their way. Oh, to draw back the grim curtain of night, one glimpse of Jesus, and all will be bright. All that I want is Jesus. He satisfies joy. He supplies. Life would be worthless without him. All things in Jesus I found. Oh! 
butterflies. Life would be wondrous without Him. All to see Jesus, I find. Some carry burdens whose weight has for years crushed them with sorrow and blinded with tears. Yet one stands ready to help them just now. If they Rugged cross, the selfless pain he bore. He breathed his final breath that I would be restored by his body that was broken, precious blood freely shed. The spotless lamb of heaven. 
has forever conquered death. Jesus is my healer. He's everything. It's everything. It's everything. Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. 
The Lord bless everyone today in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our retreat. Thank you for touching lives, transforming hearts, doing good in every life. Thank you for the all-sufficient Jesus, who is sufficient for every need, every need in every life, every need in every family, every need in every community. And we're asking, Lord, today that your word, once again, as it reveals Christ more and more unto us, will have the greater benefit and uh, manifesting every life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. A good, good amen. God's, God has blessed you. You can sit down. We're continuing in the revelation of Jesus from the scriptures. And today we're looking at Jesus, the great healer and helper interceding for every individual. Every individual, everyone here, everyone everywhere. Christ knows you. He loves you. And he intercedes, he prays. It takes your body. It takes your request. It takes all the necessities you have. It takes it to the Father in prayer. That means it's interceding. It's also helping. And it's healing. And it's the great one that cannot fail. The great one whose power knows no limit. Jesus, the great healer and helper, interceding. For every individual. We're told in Isaiah chapter 53. I'm looking at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In verse 5 it says, but he. He, Jesus, he, the one who is great, mighty, healing, helping, interceding, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. I am healed. Then in verse 12, he tells us, therefore, will I, the Almighty, therefore, will I, will I, God in heaven, divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul, Christ, Savior, Redeemer. He has poured out a soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many. Look at this, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's the office of Christ, that's the ministry of Christ. He makes intercession for everyone on earth. Because everyone all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're told in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 25. Wherefore, he, Christ again, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. The only way to come to God the only way to touch the Father, the only way to reach the Father is that we come through Jesus Christ, seeing that he ever lived to make intercession for them. He ever liveth, he lives now. He's seated at the right hand of majesty, and he makes intercession for everyone. Verse 26, he says, For such an high priest, Became us, befitted us, answers to our need, such a high priest 
became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's the one we're talking about. That's the one we've been talking about in this retreat. The all sufficient Jesus of death. Uh, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, G, Jesus is the good shepherd for sheep and for the saints. And H, Jesus, the high priest, helper of saints and of the seekers. G, uh, then then number three, Jesus, this is I, the interpreter of scripture to the sightless. The people who read and don't understand, sightless, spiritually. The people who go through the scriptures and they don't know it's for them. And they don't know the provision of the Lord and the promise of the Lord and the power of the Lord in their lives. They read but they cannot see, they cannot understand, they cannot perceive. Sightless. Jesus is the interpreter of scripture to the sightless. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at Jesus the good shepherd for the sheep and for the saints. In John chapter 10, reading from verse 11, I am the good shepherd. So clear, I am. No other one is. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known of mine. He is the good shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the glorious shepherd. We're told in Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 20. Hebrews 13. Verse 20, now the God of peace will bring peace in your heart, peace in your family. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Then verse 21, make you perfect. In every good work to do his will, walking in you, that which is well pleasing in his sight, and he brought through Jesus Christ to who to whom the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're looking at three things here concerning Jesus. Number one, he is the gift of God for all seekers of satisfaction. What you have does not satisfy. Material things do not satisfy. Earthly things do not satisfy. Earthly pleasure does not satisfy. Earthly property does not satisfy. That's why Christ Jesus has been saved at the gift of God for you, for me, for everyone seeking satisfaction. Number two, he is the governor who suffered for all his subjects. The governor who suffered for all his subjects. Number three, he is the giver. Of the spirit for strength. When he's strength, strength to stand, stand firm, strength to stand, stand uncompromising, strength to stand, stand in the word, in the will of God. We need strength, the strength to be steadfast in the Lord. And he is the giver of the spirit for our strength. Look at number one. The gift of God for all seekers of satisfaction. In John chapter 4, reading from verse 10, 
Jesus was talking to the woman. He could have been talking to you. And what he says to one, he says to all. What he said to her, he's saying to you. Look at what he said in John chapter 4 verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, as he's saying unto you, If thou knewest the gift of God was telling the woman, you're talking about water, you're talking about bucket, you're talking about having the rope to put the bucket in the well and draw the water. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him the gift of God and he would have given thee living water living water. The gift of God is the gift of God to you. We don't earn a gift. It's out of the love of the giver that he gives us that gift. It says in verse 14, in verse 14, but whosoever drinketh of the water that did this water that I shall give him the giver, the gift, and I give him freely. He shall never thirst for the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. As we receive him today, as we accept him today, as we abide and remain in him today, this gift of everlasting life will be yours in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, not of your labor, not of your earning, not of your religious city, not of the good works that you have done, not of claiming to be this or that. It is not of yourself. Salvation is not what you can dig up by sweating and laboring. Salvation is not what you can get on the top of any mountain by exercising yourself. It is the gift of God. And I pray that gift of salvation, of forgiveness, of freedom from sin, of power over sin, the Lord bring to every life in Jesus' name. But you must know it is not of the labor of my hand or anything I could do. But my tears forever flow. And my zeal no respite, no. Could I labor and labor and say I'm searching, seeking for eternal life. All this for sin cannot atone. Thou and thou alone must save. You come to the Lord to have the gift, the gift of eternal life. He'll give you in Jesus' name. And then in Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 32, that he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, everyone, from that side to that side, everyone, the Lord has counted you in. And you are in. Because he gave Christ for us all, for the low, for the high, for the sinful, for the good-natured, for the big, for the small, for the one on ground here, for the one everywhere, everywhere you find yourself. Christ is the gift of God for you, and it will satisfy you to the fullest in Jesus' name, he that, sp that spared not his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, freely, freely give us all things? All things are yours. 
all things spiritual, all things supernatural, all things strengthening. They are yours in Jesus. Number one is the gift of God for all seekers of satisfaction. Number two here. Number two, he is the governor who suffered for all he subjects. Think about that, that he suffered for you. As you come, as you surrender, as you submit, as you are subjected to him. And you say, he is my Lord. He controls me. He is my Lord. He directs me. He is my Lord. I am his and his forever. For all those who surrender, submit unto him, it becomes the governor of your life. Hey, look at him now in prophecy, Psalm 22. I'm reading from verse 1. You recognize him here. He is the one that the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 22. Reading from verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are the exact words he spoke on the cross of Calvary. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Look at verse 16. In verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. And it says the assembly of wicked men, of the wicked, have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's talking about Christ when he was crucified on the cross of Calvary. They pierced my hand and they pierced my feet. They nailed him to the cross. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, they patched my garments among them. You understand? He's talking about Jesus, what will happen to him. More than a thousand years before that thing happened, the word of prophecy was written, was uttered, that he will come and he will be the substitute and the sacrifice for the sin of every sinner. And he cancels every other sacrifice because the sacrifice is final, the sacrifice is full, and the sacrifice gives us a fellowship with the Almighty God. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. What's the conclusion of all that? That Christ died for you, that Christ suffered for you, that Christ gave himself fully on the cross of Calvary. What's the conclusion? Look at verse 28. In verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among nations. He rules. He reigns. That's why he is Lord. And when you accept him as Savior, you also accept him as Lord, as the governor. He is the governor among nations. And as he governs our lives, as he controls our lives, he sets us free from everything that had bound us in the past. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 22. But now, be made free from sin. Who makes us free? A Savior, a Lord, who is the governor of everyone that come to submit to surrender absolutely unto him. Because he says, but now, be made free from sin. Sin of every type. Private. Public, common sin, habitual sin, every form of sin, those degrading sins. And the sins of the people that are well known that, you know, people don't even think about that anymore because it's a great man committing great sin and, you know, everybody now comes to accept that 
is acceptable to them. But Christ, Jesus, Savior, Lord, is the one that came to set us free from every kind of sin, common, uncommon, habitual, daily, whatever, human. The Lord has come to set you free. And what it sets you free from, you're not being bonded to that thing anymore. In Jesus' name, now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. Now we have the fruit of holiness. We have the consequence of holiness. We have the result of holiness by the redemption of the Lord. That's why God says, follow peace with all men and uh, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And blessed are the pure in heart, the holy in heart, for they shall see God. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall dwell stand in his holy mountain? They that have clean hands and a pure heart. Now, that's what Christ has come to do. He came to save us from sin and to grant us the experience of holiness in the heart, holiness in the life, holiness in the tongue, holiness in our speech, holiness in our behavior, holiness in our character. But now, be made free from sin, and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit. If you are born again, ye have your fruit. If you are connected with Christ, ye have your fruit. If you have been saved by Christ and you are subjected, surrender to Christ, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, the end result, and the end, the consequence, and the end, what you look for. On the final day, everlasting, like we're looking at number three here. He is the giver of the spirit for strength. When you are tired, you don't have strength, what can you do? When you are tired in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, what can you do? When you are tired, after you have been running and running the race, what can you do when you are tired? But then, when... You are tired, fagged out. When you are tired, exhausted, he, Christ Jesus, is the giver of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that's the Spirit that comes to give you strength. We're looking at Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 32. This Jesus, as God raised up, Whereof we all are witnesses. And then in verse 33, it says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. And then in verse 38, it tells us, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, turn around, change your mind, turn away from the old perspective, the old tradition, the old religion, and the old covenant, and turn to the Lord, repent, turn around, Look at Jesus face to face and see that he, the risen one, is now the redeemer. And through him, the Father, God in heaven, gives the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name, by the authority of Jesus Christ. For the remission, removal, the cleansing, the freedom from all sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then he says in verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children. The promise is unto you and to your children. 
the promises unto you and to your converts and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He has called me. He has called me. He calls me to salvation, I responded. He has called me. He calls me to sanctification. And I responded, now he calls me to the satisfactory fullness of the Spirit of God. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord a God shall call. Look at Luke chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 13. In Luke 11 verse 13, if he then be evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You must ask him as he gives. You must ask him, as the promise he has made, he made promise of eternal life salvation, he fulfilled it. He made the promise of making us holy, for I am God that sanctifies you. He fulfills it, now he makes the promise of baptizing us, immersing us, enveloping us with the power and the strength of the Spirit of God. And he is a good God, a faithful God. He fulfills his promises in John chapter 7. Reading from verse 37. John chapter 7 verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. In verse 38, it says, He that believeth on me. As the scripture has said, out of his belly, out of his innermost being, out of his inner man shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, it says, but they speak he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now he's glorified and that power, that strength, that enablement of the Holy Ghost is now for you. It's now for me. It's now for me. And he'll give you everything as you ask him in faith. In Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two here. Number two is, this is H now, Jesus, the high priest, the helper of saints and of all seekers. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 17. In verse 17, therefore... In all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he, Jesus, might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, for he, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor, to, sus uh, to sustain, to support them that are tempted. Able. You'll be able in your life. Look at chapter 4, Hebrews. Chapter 4, we're looking at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast a profession. It refers to Jesus, and he is the great high priest that is passed into the heavens. 
and in verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like a swear, yet without sin. Verse 16 then encourages us, actually commands us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus, the high priest, the helper of all saints and of all the seekers. Look at three things here. Number one, number one, he is the healer of the sick with his stripes. Number two, he is the heir of all for all sons and servants. Number three, he is the hope of all in submission to him, the son of God. Look at number one, the healer of the sick with his stripes. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he, Jesus, and he, our healer, and he, our redeemer, and he, the one that came to solve the sin problem, the sickness problem, the spirit problem. The one that came to relieve us and to recover us from all sicknesses. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. He'll do it today. I said he will do it today. Look at verse 17. It says that it may be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying he himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. We're told in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good went about doing good and it's still the same today jesus christ the same yesterday and today and forever he went about doing good he's going about this morning everywhere he's doing good he'll get to you there he will do good in your life he went about doing good and healing and healing all that are oppressed of, tell me, tell me out aloud, of the devil. There are people, whatever is happening to them, who they say is of God. If they have cancer, they say it's God. If they have incurable disease, they say it's God. If there's an accident, they say it's God. If any of their people are drowned in the sea, they say, it's God. No. Sickness is not of God. I didn't hear you. Yeah. Cancer is not of God. Incurable disease is not of God. Now, understand. If the sicknesses were of God, and Jesus went about healing them. He'll be walking against the Father. He'll be opposing the Father. He'll be saying, my Father, I know you want them sick. But I disagree with you. I want them well. Jesus was never in disagreement with the Heavenly Father. I and my father are one. Always in agreement with the father. So 
when he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He was against the devil. He was not against his father. It's God, his father, that anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. And that's why the father sent him all around, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. If he was doing something contrary to the will of the Father, God will not be with him. It's like, you know, his son being rebellious to the Father. The Father says, my son, I'm not with you in this one. It's like a daughter in rebellion to the mother. The mother says, my daughter, I'm not with you in this one. It's when you are doing the will of God, you're in obedience to the Father that God is with you. And Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And the Father and Jesus, they're united this morning to bring healing to you in Jesus' name. And look at First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 24. It says, who is own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin. Dead to sin. Dead to sin. And we were not interested in the imitation of sin anymore. It says, come. No, I'm out of that class. I've graduated from that. I won't do that. Why don't you do that? Because I'm dead to the sin, and the sin is dead to me. Every born again child of God, every saint of God is dead to sin. And all the sins of the past, all the sinful practices of the past, you are dead to them. If you have met Jesus, if you have come across Jesus, if you are converted by Jesus, if you are renewed, if you are refined, if you are reformed by the blood of Jesus, you are dead, dead to sin. And sin doesn't capture your interest anymore. Sin doesn't capture uh, your will anymore. Your will against every, against every sin. And every sin that comes as temptation, you are dead unto them. It says being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. I am healed. If ye were healed, then you are healed. If he was healed, then he is healed. If I was healed, then today I am healed. Anybody there? I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. By his suffering, I am healed. By his sacrifice, I am healed. The healer of the sick with his stripes. Look at number two here. Number two, the heir. Those who inherit the heir of all false sons and servants. He has inherited everything and inherited that for you and for me. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1. We're looking at verse 2. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir, heir, inheritor of all things, by whom also he made the world. He has now appointed him to inherit all things for you and for me. In Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, verse many, as are led by the Spirit of God. Look at that. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. There are different kinds of spirit. There is the spirit of the world, the spirit of the age, the spirit of the last days. Some people are led by the spirit of the world. There's the spirit of Satan. 
the people who are led, who are controlled, who are directed by the spirit of the evil one. There is the spirit of the human. The human. We have spirit, we have soul, we have body. There are people who are led by, I see, I feel, I want to, I desire, by the spirit of the weak, of weak humanity. But the spirit of God, knowing the scripture given by God, he directs us, he controls us in our action, in our attitude, in our character, in our behavior, in our thoughts, in our planning, in the direction we go in life. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It tells us in verse 15, for ye have not received, look at that, the spirit of bondage. There's a spirit of bondage again to fear. There are people, the people that work, operate by the spirit of the world, they have the spirit of the tyrant. And they want to bring everyone under their own control. And they want you to look away from the spirit of God and look into the spirit of bondage so that you'll not have the freedom to live the life of the true believer. And they want to bring you in the spirit of bondage by the way they act, the things they say, the actions they perform. If you submit to that, you cannot submit to the spirit of God and the spirit of bondage. At the same time, you have to make your choice. And if you are submissive to the spirit of bondage, you come in bondage back to sin, back to transgression, back to iniquity. And that spirit of bondage will make you to fear every time. You want to set right things that are wrong, Spirit of bondage will bring fear. You want to do restitution. Spirit of bondage will bring fear. You want to turn around and go the right direction in life. The spirit of bondage will bring fear. But it says we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Give me a good amen there. I say that after me. I have not received. The spirit of bondage again to fear. Any minister there, if you're a minister, you fear your congregation, and you fear the king makers, those who appoint uh, pastors, employ pastors, pay pastors, if you're in the spirit of bondage to them, to those king makers in the church, You'll never do the will of God. You'll be operating on the fear. I've learned about Jesus, the all-sufficient Jesus. If I take that to the congregation, I know how they will react. The spirit of bondage will bind your fear. And if you have learned a new life, the new life to live and the direction to go. And then you think, if I do that, I carry this new life to the office, what will the, my colleagues in the office say? Again, you are submitting to the spirit of bondage, to fear. You will not be able to rise up from the ground and do anything, everything. The and the Lord has visited you and is saying this is how to live, this is how to act, and this is where to go. And then you come out from that close set of prayer and the Spirit of God has empowered you, energized you, and you now you come to the place where you are to do what God has called you to do. And you look at the people, they're always there. And they come with the spirit of bondage, to fear. Then you're afraid you are not able to declare the whole counsel of God. You will live your life in fear. And your future will be on the other side. God will say, I spoke to you. And you looked up to the people more than you looked up to me. You will not get to that place you thought you were going to. But when you break free 
from every spirit of bondage and there's no fear in your heart then it says you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we say Abba Father look at verse 16 and the spirit bear it witness with our spirit that we are the children of God look at verse 17 in verse 17 and if children, if we're children, then we're heirs, we're heirs of heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Everything Christ has, all the possibilities in Christ, you also have joint heirs with Christ. If so be that ye suffer with him, persecution may be there, that we we also be glorified together. We'll be glorified with the Lord eventually in Jesus' name. Alpha location, amen. amen. Revelation chapter 21, we're looking at verse 7. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, he that overcometh, I will overcome. He that overcometh, I'll overcome temptation. I can't hear you. He that overcometh, I will overcome all trials. You know, all those things that come into your life, they just come to try you to see whether you have become a new creature in Christ or whether you are still the old creature just wearing uh, the plastic or the, or the cast of a new creature. And when they come uh, as trials, Thank God you will overcome. Shall inherit all things. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Look at number three here. Number three, he is the hope of all who are in submission to the Son, Christ Jesus, the hope of all in submission to the Son. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Colossians 1, 27, to whom God would make known what is the, rich, what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in your heart, the hope of glory, Christ in your life, the hope of glory, Christ in everything you do is the hope of glory. When you accept Christ, you receive Christ, and you retain Christ in your heart, in your life, and in that race, and it controls you from the heart, from your spirit, from the inside. Christ in you is the hope of glory. In verse 28, whom will preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And the only hope that we can be perfect, the only hope that he can take away, cleanse away every imperfection from our lives is Christ dwelling in us. And the apostles said that's why we preach him in fullness. That's why we preach him with freedom. That's why we preach him with faith that he will so abide, dwell, remain in us that we, he might perfect everything in our lives and that is the hope of glory. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, when you came in at verse 3, you say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us, that being born again, has begotten us again unto a lively 
hope. It's the new birth. It's the salvation. It's the receiving of eternal life that makes us to have this lively salvation by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then in verse 4, it tells us to an inheritance incorruptible, to an inheritance undefiled, to an inheritance that fadeth not away, to an inheritance reserved in heaven for you. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 1. In First John chapter 3, verse 1, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. The world recognizes us not. The world honors us not. It says we are now the children of God and has bestowed upon us is love. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Behold, now are we the sons of God. Now am I a child of God. Now am I a child of God. Now am I a child of God. And it does not yet appear. Watch we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We're looking forward to that. We shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. Look at verse 3. And every man and everyone that has this hope of being there with him, being glorified with him, seeing him as he is and becoming like him. Everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself, purifies himself, purifies himself even as he is pure. The hope, the hope of being with Christ, the hope of becoming like Christ, the hope of reigning with Christ belongs to the people that take the privilege, the provision of the blood of the Lamb to purify themselves even as he is pure. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, Jesus the Interpreter. Of scripture to the sightless. The people who read the scriptures, the sightless, they're without perception. They're without understanding. There are people that read their system of reading the Bible from, generation, from Genesis to Revelation every year. And yet, of what they read, it doesn't sink into them to make any change, to make any intervention from heaven, to make any translation, and to make any transformation in their lives. They read and read, they're sightless. They do not have the faith to see that promise is mine, that provision is is mine. That proclamation of scripture is mine. They read but they are sightless. And Christ is the interpreter of scripture to the sightless. Look at Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 27 and beginning at Moses, the books of Moses, and all the prophets, the books of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He interpreted unto them to open their understanding and to put the word as light to their heart that will give them sight 
to see. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, it says, And the said one to another, Did not our heart burn? They didn't say, Did not our head turn? No. It doesn't turn the head. It burns the heart. Penetrates the heart. Changes the heart. When you actually have Christ, it's a preaching. The word of God unto you. It gets in your heart. It burns in the heart. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? He opened to us the scriptures. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45, then opened he their understanding then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures jesus and the interpreter of the scriptures to the cyclists we're looking at three things here number one the intercessor for our steadfastness and security is interceding for us that whatever wind may blow and whatever things may happen, that we will be steadfast and secured in the faith. Number two is the image of splendor shining through the saints. It shines through us and a splendid light and a supernatural light and the spiritual light shines forth in our lives. Number three is the invisible made visible to surrendered saints, surrendered souls in supplication when we come to pray. Making supplication before God. The people who pray, they don't have the sense of the nearness of God. It's like they're praying and their prayer does not go beyond the ceiling. But Christ is the visible one that makes God visible to those who are surrendered and submissive to him when they are in supplication. Look at number one. Number one, the intercessor for our steadfastness and security. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He saves, he secures, he makes them steadfast in that salvation, and he makes them to shine forth with the light of the gospel. Because he is ever living to make intercession for them. Look at verse 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He is the intercessor and is pleading for you, praying for you. Before the Father in heaven. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 34. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who is he that condemned it? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen, and who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. What a joy. 
what confidence we have to know that we will go through safely, that we will go through soundly, because Christ is by the right hand side of God, and he maketh intercession for you, for me. You are not fail. You are not fall. You are not faint. Because there is the Jesus, your Savior, who is also now seated on the right hand side of God and is making an intercession for you. When Christ was here on earth, he said, Father, I know that you hear me always. Now, it's right there by the right hand of the Heavenly Father. If when he was on earth, the Father always heard him, how much more? Now, seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, making intercession for you, the Lord God in heaven will answer his prayer concerning you. When he answers a prayer, what happens? Look at verse 35. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 36. In verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are accounted a sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, nay. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. Nay, in all these things, I am more than a conqueror. Through him that loved me. I lost your voice. Look at verse 38. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Hold on. Sometimes you have a dream. And there are some queer things you saw in the dream and it's like those queer things strange things when you wake up in the morning you think of them rather than thinking of jesus your intercessors no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper no weapon from any direction from the bottom of the sea from the depths of the wilderness of the bush and from the skies and the abode of the principalities of powers, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you shall be condemned by the great judge of heaven because your righteousness is of him. That's why it says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come. Verse 39, no height, no depth, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Amen. Amen. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He makes the intercession for us in John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them. Purify them. Purge them. Transform them. Send the fire from heaven to burn every child, useless thing from their lives. Purify their hearts. 
sanctify them is praying for us that's intercession through thy truth thy word is truth look at verse 20 in verse 20 neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word he prayed for our sanctification we're coming to number two he is number two the image of splendor shining through saints in second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 but we all all the children of god we all all the people of god we all all saved souls we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the lord are changed are transformed into the same image from glory to glory you'll be going up you'll not go down you'll be going forward you'll not go backward because as we're beholding, as we learn of him, he changes us from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. In Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's he wants, what he wants of us. He wants us to be conformed, not to the heroes of the world. He wants us to be conformed, not to the people of the world in the same profession with us. You know, the people who are trained in the same profession with us, this is how they do. No, you cannot be conformed to them. They don't have the perfect image of Christ before them in everything they do. And you are to be conformed to the image of his son. His attitude, his character, his action, everything that he did. He says that we might be conformed unto the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at number three here. Number three is the invisible that makes visible to those who are surrendered, submissive to him in supplication. The invisible made visible. First Timothy chapter 1 Verse 17, now, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, 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 the only wise God, the honor and glory forever and ever, forever and ever, yeah. amen. Now, when you have a task, when you have an assignment when you have a responsibility when you have a duty to carry out but the duty the assignment is enormous and the thing of the people that are visible to you they're the people that will say please Moses don't bring that here let my people go that they may serve Moses Please, if you love your life, these people have been captives of my authority for hundreds of years. And you come and you want to say, release all these servants. I will not release them. Moses said, God sent me to you. Let my people go. So I don't know that God now. If you come to that situation, Pharaoh, 
is visible. The tyrant is visible. The one that wants to prevent you from going forward is visible. And if your God is invisible and your enemy is visible, you concentrate on what that enemy, what that tyrant, what that despot, and what that Pharaoh is saying because he is the only one visible to you. But if you are going to do the impossible, which you will do, if you are going to do the incredible, which you will do, if you are going to do the unprecedented, which you are going to do by the grace of God, you must have the invisible to become visible unto you. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 27. Hebrews 11, verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt. By faith he forsook everything, even the despot tyrant in Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured a seeing him who is invisible. He saw his God all the time. He remembered the burning bush all the time. He heard, he retained the voice of God all the time. Before Pharaoh, he didn't see Pharaoh, he saw the invisible. Before the magicians, he didn't see the magicians, he saw the invisible. Before the Red Sea, he didn't see the Red Sea, he saw the invisible. And when you come to prayer like that today, you don't see your sickness, you don't see your problem, you don't see the devil, you don't see the demons, you see the invisible. I said you see the invisible. And the invisible God will show up and break every yoke in your life. And everything that stands in your way to do you what God wants you to do, the invisible will be made visible to you and everything in your life will be all right. Are you going to pray from the depth of your heart? Not praying as usual because the usual prayer, we see the problem, we're crying. We see the problem, we're screaming. We see the problem and it's like, you know, we're ready. We're ready, emptied out. It's like nothing, nothing. Nothing can happen. But when you come to pray with a different mind, and by faith, you can forsake everything you have learned in Egypt, everything you have known in Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. But you pray, and you endure in prayer, as uh, seeing the invisible. Great, great manifestations of miracles will happen in your life. The Israelites that Pharaoh said will not go out, they'll come out of bondage. And the Red Sea that said they will not move forward, the Red Sea will clear before you. And all the Amalekites in the land, in the wilderness, that blocked them, and the Balaam and the Balak wanting to stop them, you will go through every difficulty and every challenge, Balak will be forgotten. Balaam will be forgotten. And we'll see you on the other side. You even cross the river Jordan. The Jericho walls will fall. You'll be in the land of promise in Jesus' name. I will be there. I will be there. Why don't you rise up and now come with the faith in this all sufficient Jesus so that you will have everything he has ordained for you to have. Open your mouth now and talk to the Lord in prayer.
Great people of God, Amen. Great people of God, Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and sins to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. In First Peter 1.15, it is written, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. We must pray in holiness at this very material time. We must pray in spirit and we must pray in faith. Let's first of all appreciate God for the life of his great servant. Please wave to Jesus for the life of his great servant, for the great blessings that we received through his great servant, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui, the great evangelist of our generation. Please pray for more grace upon the life of our father. Pray for more unction upon the life of our great father. Pray for more strength upon the life of our Father. Let's pray for more grace upon his life so that God will use him and continue to use him for his glory and service to humanity. Pray, 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 church, pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let's pray, church. For the success of day one of Global Crusade and Easter Retreat. We started on the 28th of March. It was glorious. It was wonderful to the glory of God. Let's appreciate God for day one of the Global Crusade and the Easter Retreat. Hallelujah. Let's pray for the message. The message that we receive this morning. Let's pray and ask the all-sufficient Jesus. Who by his mercy put in place this very great crusade. We learn from our father that Jesus is the great healer and helper interceding for every individual as jesus is interceding for me is interceding for you and is interceding for all of us let's appreciate jesus let's thank jesus for that privilege of interceding on our behalf let's pray to jesus pray Pray, Jesus is seated at the right hand side of God, interceding on our behalf. Oh, what a privilege. Oh, what a privilege. Oh, what a privilege. Oh, what a privilege to be a believer in Christ. Let's appreciate Jesus for interceding on our behalf in the throne of God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let's pray to Jesus as we learn from his servant. Jesus is the only good shepherd. Not only shepherd, but the good shepherd for the sheep and the saints. Let's pray and appreciate Jesus for being our good shepherd. Because Jesus is our shepherd, we shall not be in want. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Let's appreciate Jesus for being the governor for all who suffer. Let's thank Jesus for being our governor and the governor among all nations. Let's appreciate Jesus for the gift 
for all the seekers and the satisfaction and our satisfaction. Let's appreciate the all sufficient Jesus. Let's thank Jesus for the powerful message we receive this morning and ask for grace to be doers of his words and not the hearers alone. Let's appreciate Jesus. Father, we honor you for the privilege to listen to your servant this morning. We appreciate you for your grace. We appreciate you for your faithfulness as we continue in this program. By your special grace, more blessings will be our portion in Jesus' name. Jesus will reveal himself to us more and more in Jesus' name. You will continue to use your servant in the glorious and dramatic way in Jesus' name. To the glory and honor of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Give me holy amen, church of God. A victorious amen. Thank you, Reverend Dopper. This message is wonderful. We need to add more prayers. I want you to open your mouths and pray again and talk to the great healer and the helper who is interceding for every one of us. The gift of God for all seekers of satisfaction. Pray. Call upon the Lord at this time. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. I thank you for your sacrifice for me. I give myself to you. I give myself to your shepherdness. I give yourself, I give myself to your leadership. I give myself to your, for your gift unto me. He is a gift of God. Seek him. Remember, only seekers can enjoy the gift. Seek and ye shall find. Only seekers can enjoy this gift of God. We are saved by grace through that gift. And we are saved by grace through what God has done unto us. He is the governor who suffered for all his subjects. He suffered for the great. He suffered for the small man. He suffered for the little children. He suffered for great adults. He suffered for the rich. He suffered for the poor. He suffered for the educated. He suffered for those who are illiterate. He has suffered for you. What have you given unto him? Release yourself to the Holy Spirit this morning to pray through you. To pray through you. Open your hearts unto God. God he is the giver of the spirit for strength. What can you do without the strength of God? What can you do without the strength of God? What can you do without the strength of God? Tell the Lord, the giver, the giver of strength. Here am I. Turn my weakness to strength. Turn my weakness to strength. He's the giver of the spirit. That last day of the feast, Jesus too. And he said, if any man thirst, if any man thirst, if any man thirst, are you thirsty? If any man thirst, are you thirsty? Remember, you must be thirsty. You must be thirsty. You must be thirsty. Pour your heart unto God. God of heaven is listening to your prayers. God of heaven is hearing your prayer at this time. The giver of the spirit for strength. He poured the spirit upon the early church. We are here today. He is going to pour his spirit upon your life. Tell the Lord, here am I. Pour your spirit upon me. The spirit of grace, pour your spirit upon me. The spirit of strength, pour your spirit upon me. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the helper. The helper of saints. The helper of seekers. I want you to pray and say, The high priest for my soul. You are interceding for me. And I come before the high priest now. What do you want? That the high priest cannot intercede on your behalf. Open your mouth right now. You are praying to the great high priest. 
He's the healer of the sick with his stripes. With his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. Remember, when he was on earth, he went about doing good, seeking all and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And today, he is still doing good. Open your mouth and pray. Are you sick in your body? He is the healer of the sick. Are you sick in your body? By his stripes, we are healed already in the past tense. We are healed already. Pray, pray. Thank God for your prayer. Pray more. Pray more. Open your mouth and 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 pray more. You can see the special prayer this morning. We had the first session by our Reverend, Reverend Micah, and here we are again, having another session of the prayer. Pray and tell the Lord, this is a special moment of prayer. And tell God, O oh Lord, do it again. O oh Lord, do it again. Remember, he is the heir of all, for all sons and servants. For all sons and servants, he is the heir. He is the heir. He is the heir. For all sons and servants. Who are the sons and servants? Remember, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Which spirit is leading you? Pray this morning and say, Lord, I don't want the spirit of the world to lead me. I don't want the spirit of Satan to lead me. I don't want the spirit of evil to lead me. I don't want the spirit of the modern time to lead me. Oh Lord, I give myself to your spirit. I give myself to your spirit. Let the Holy Spirit take the leadership of my life. Let the Holy Spirit take the leadership of my family. Let the Holy Spirit take the leadership of my ministry. Let the Holy Spirit take the leadership of my decisions. Let the Holy Spirit take the leadership of what I do. Open your mouth and pray. Pray against any other spirit other than the spirit of God against any other spirit other than the spirit of god oh lord i surrender to your spirit i surrender to your spirit because as many as are led by the spirit of god they they are the sons of god they are the sons of god In Jesus' name we pray. He is the hope of all in submission to the Son. What is your hope? What is your hope? Do you have hope of eternity in heaven? Do you have hope of his coming back again? Pray. And say, Lord, this morning I make you my home. I make heaven my home. I make your kingdom my home. I make the coming of the Lord my home. And that's why he says that you can be pure even in this life as he is pure, as he is holy, as he is righteous. Open your mouth and pray. Make him your hope. Make him your hope. Make him your hope. Jesus, Jesus. Make him your hope. Heaven. Make heaven your hope. Make heaven your hope. Make his coming again your hope. Make his coming again your hope. Pray. Pray. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Beloved. Are we the sons of God? And he says, now, are we the sons of God? Now, are we the sons of God? It does not yet appear what we yet shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man, and every woman, and every minister, and every pastor, and every bishop, and every man, and every boy, and every girl, that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure brothers and sisters open your mouth and pray purify your heart if you have this hope in you purify your heart 
Purify your tongue. Purify your language. Purify your lifestyle. Pray, 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 pray. Purify yourself. Because he is our hope. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come to I, Jesus, the interpreter of scripture to the sightless. You are going to pray that every confusion in reading the Bible, every misinterpretation in reading the Bible. Are you a preacher? Who is interpreting the Bible to you? Are you a student of the Bible? Who is interpreting the Bible to you? Jesus is the one interpreting it to the heart, not to the head. To the heart, not to the head. Their heart burned. Their head did not turn. Open your mouth and pray. And tell the Lord, here am I. From today, enlighten my eye. Take away my blindness. Take away my sightlessness. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. Thank God for the way you are praying. Pray more. Pray more over there. Pray more to my right hand side. Pray more to my left hand side. Pray more at my front. Pray more to the bank. Pray more all those in canopies. Pray more all those under the trees all over. Pray, pray, pray. And tell the Lord, take away my spiritual blindness. And make me to have clear sight. The intercessor for our steadfastness and security. Pray. You will remain steadfast. You will remain steadfast. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Nothing. Nothing on earth. Nothing under the earth. Nothing in the sea. Nothing above. Nothing below. Nothing seen. Nothing unseen. Should turn you away. To your perdition. Pray and say Lord. Nothing will turn me away. I make up my mind. No going back. No turning back. No turning back. Be a shining saint. Be a shining believer. Because Jesus is the image of the splendor. And shining through say. Tell him this morning. Shine through me. 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 Tell the Lord, shine through me. Pray. Pray. He is the invisible that's made visible to surrender souls in supplication. That's the final aspect of our prayer. Moses saw the invisible. Moses saw the invisible. Moses saw the invisible. Pray and say, Lord, I see the invisible. I don't want to see mountains around me. I see the invisible. I don't want to see challenges, mountains, sicknesses, powers of darkness, bad dreams, and all the nightmares. I don't want my attention to be focused on those things. Lord, I see the invisible. In the morning, I see the invisible. At night, I see the invisible. In the storms of life, I see the invisible. When I'm climbing my mountains, I see the invisible. When I hear strange noise, I see the invisible. When discouragement surrounds me, I see the invisible. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. I want to hear the global amen all over the world in all the continents. Lift up those hands as we pray together now. Father, in the name of Jesus. We come before Jesus, the great healer. We come before Jesus, the great helper. We come before Jesus, the interceding savior for every individual. Lord, this morning, our confidence is strengthened. Our hope is lifted. And we trust you 
that from this very day, you have taken us to another level. We depend on Jesus from today. The gift of God for all seekers, we depend on you. The governor who suffered for all people, we depend on you. And the giver of the spirit for strength, we depend on you. The high priest of our souls, we depend on you. The helper of sins and seekers, we depend on you. The one that is the healer of the sea, we come before you. The one that is the heir of all sons and servants, we come before you. And Lord, we submit ourselves to you. You are our hope. And whosoever has this hope in him, purify it himself. Purify your church. Purify the body of Christ. Purify every individual. Make us ready for your coming. Take away every impurity and every unrighteousness and make us steadfast, more than conquerors, never turning back, never looking at our mountains, never looking at impossibilities, never looking at anything discouraging because we are looking at the invisible. From today, you have lifted up our faith. We will never go down to the valley. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We rise up on our feet as we take our congregational songs from our program sheet, page two. More holiness, give me more striving within. More holiness, give me more striving within, more patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of his care, more joy in his service, more purpose in prayer, more gratitude give me, more trust in the Lord, more pride in his glory, more hope in his words, more tears for his sorrow, more pain at his grief, more meekness in trial, more praise for relief. More purity give me, more strength to overcome. More freedom from art stain, more longing for home. More feed for the kingdom, more use would I be. More blessed, more blessed and holy, more savior life.
striving with you. Sublime is the cross where Christ suffered and died, gave his life, my poor soul to make you. Now, my soul does reside in the Lamb crucified. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, for the cure. I don't want, I don't want.
change that was ever so strange when she did so bad God's only way. If we walk against light, stumble on through the light in the flesh, rebellious and self willed on that great judgment day. We'll have nothing to say for itself and the world we will feed. I don't want, I don't want, and I don't live in my heart. I was raised and satisfied and set apart. Many things for others Choice and the strife of the road and in life, and I look on my dear Savior's face, on my dear Savior's face. Hear him say, Child, well done, a great race you have done. I will thank him for one. Praise the Lord. We thank God for this day that God has brought us together for this wonderful time with the Lord. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we bless your name. We glorify thee because of how you have been blessing us since we started this program. We thank you because you are the Lord who is all sufficient for us. Jesus, the Son of God, we pray that the heavens be opened unto us this morning. We pray that you minister to us from thy word. We pray that all that thing, all those things that need to be exposed to us, all those things we need to understand, that you make us to be fit for heaven, help us to really be ready to understand them, and that the word of God will have a place in our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you x-ray us 
and all those things that are filthy, those things that are pollution, all those things that are corrupting, those things that will hinder us from being able to fulfill our destiny, those things that will hinder us from being able to gain admission to heaven, ex expose them to us, and we pray that the grace to abandon them, the grace to get rid of them out of our lives, we pray that to give unto everyone in Jesus' name. This morning we pray that sinners will be saved, we pray that believers will be sanctified, and Lord, your power will come upon us to give us the grace to live victorious Christian lives. Thank you, mighty God, for your answer our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to this subject this morning on the little foxes that spoil the vine. Little foxes that spoil the vine. I want to take a text from the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. I want us to look at this subject, little foxes that, shy, that spoil the vine. The Bible often uses picture language to help us understand deeper lessons. Foxes are animals that appear to be innocent, but they are actually crafty. They are clever animals. Foxes are destructive regardless of the size, whether they are little or big. As a matter of fact, foxes have been used several in the Bible as a metaphor for destruction. Little foxes in this context refers to those things, those negative attitudes, those negative habits, negative actions or behaviors that we more often overlook. We excuse them or we defend them. Inconsequential or non-consequential, as we may attempt to make them, they could have a huge negative impact on our lives. We overlook, excuse, or defend these little evils because we have not fully understood the implication of what Christ did on the cross. The question is, did Jesus Christ die so just to forgive us our sins when we get born again and then expects us to figure out how to live right henceforth? No. Jesus Christ took away our sins when he died on the cross at Calvary and then made grace available to help us to live the victorious life. The book of 1 John chapter 3, I read verse 5. 1 John chapter 3, I read verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Jesus was revealed. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that he can take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Jesus Christ died not to increase our sin. Jesus Christ died not to establish sin in our lives, but to take away our sin. Jesus Christ died not to excuse our sin, but to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. Jesus Christ died not to pamper us in sin, but to take away our sin. And so this morning, we believe that as the Lord enables us, the Lord will enable us to understand and we open our eyes to see those little, little foxes that spoil the vine of the grace of God, the vine of the fruit of the Spirit, the vine that are tender. The Lord will open our eyes to discover them and get us delivered from them. We are going to look at this subject from these three perspectives. Number one, diverse portraits of the little foxes. Diverse portraits or diverse pictures of the little foxes or diverse postures of the little foxes. Diverse portraits of the little foxes. That's number one. Number two, devastating potentials of the little evil family. Devastating or destructive potentials of the little evil family. Number three, deliverance from the pollutions of the little foxes. My friend, if you have been really overcome or you have been really having any affliction, any 
domination, domin dominion effect of the little foxes in your life, today the Lord will bring deliverance. There will be deliverance from the pollutions. There will be deliverance from the corruptions of the little foxes. Number one, we want to look at diverse portraits of the little foxes. And uh, we look again at the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spread the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. These are little foxes that have been sent by the enemy into the lives of believers and to really hinder them from being able to fulfill their destiny. These are little foxes, little attitudes, character, behaviors that the devil is making us to pamper, to overlook, and is hindering us from being able to make progress to the promised land. We're going to look at this subject from these three perspectives. Number one, description of the little foxes. Description of the little foxes. Number two, discovering the little foxes in our lives. Discovering the little foxes in our lives. And number three, different appearances of other little evils. Different appearances or manifestations of other little evils. Number one, description of the little foxes. The fox is a crafty, corny animal. It never goes out alone to seek for food but is always in the company of 40 or 50 other foxes together. They do not go out for food in the daytime because they know they will be caught by the hunter. But they wait till it gets dark and they eat plants of different kinds. Sometimes they eat up the roots and at other times they eat up the fruits. And so that the farmer will be frustrated, have labored and labored and gotten fruits and not be able to enjoy the fruits because of the activity of these little foxes. And uh, we know, first of all, the little foxes refer to whatever we permit to eat all the roots of grace and the fruit of the spirit from our lives. That's the spiritual implication. They refer to whatever we permit to eat all the roots of grace and the fruit of the spirit from our lives. And these things enter into our lives slowly. Uh, vines have tender grapes. Secondly, the little foxes are those things we permit to rob us of the tenderness of heart with which we started the Christian race. When we started the Christian race, we want to really see that we are unstoppable to get to that promised land. But the little foxes come along the way, along the line to be able to hinder us from fulfilling our destiny. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, Chapter 3, verse 12. Hebrews, chapter 3, I read verse 12. Hebrews, chapter 3, I read from verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. This is the warning the Lord is giving. This is the caution the Lord is giving to you and myself. As we have started the Christian race, we want to get to heaven. We have to take it, we have to be cautious. We have to watch out because of the evil heart of unbelief that may make us to depart from the living God, but exalt one another daily. Why it is called today, lest any of you be adding through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Why it is said, today, if we hear his voice, harden not your heart. We shouldn't in any way through murmuring and grumbling, complaining, critical spirit, hiding our hearts, hinder us from being able to allow the grace of God to be made manifest fully in our lives. Through grumbling, through unbelief, we shouldn't allow the enemy to hinder us from getting to the promised land. And these little, little foxes, they come in such a way through disobedience, to the word of God. And um, we see that Jesus Christ, when he was in the world, he even described Herod, who wanted to hinder him from being able to feed the will of the Father. He described him as a fox. He compared him to the fox because of his corny, crafty way. And so, believers, we are cautioned, we are warned that we should avoid getting into the trap of these little, little foxes. The 
discovering the little foxes in our lives. Number two, discovering the little foxes in our lives. We shouldn't allow any of these little foxes to come into our lives. It will defile us. It will make us to be hindered from being able to get to the end of the journey. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, I read verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man, my, my brother, looking diligently, lest any man, my sister, fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defied. The root of bitterness is this little fox, that if you allow it to spring in our hearts, do you allow any root of bitterness in your life as a result of somebody has offended you? Maybe your husband has offended you and then you cannot be able to have the forgiving spirit. And then this root of bitterness springs up in your heart. You cannot pray with your partner, you can't pray with your wife. And then when you wake up in the morning, there is hatred. There is bitterness because of the root of unforgiving spirit that has come into one's heart. And the word of God tells us, that these little foxes in our lives could be unconfessed sins. These little foxes could be delayed restitution. You are supposed to say, I'm sorry to your partner. Please forgive me. Or to say, where well, is coming to really apologize. He's the one that's supposed to really apologize to me. And then, gradually, we allow these little foxes of delayed restitution to hinder us from being able to make progress in our Christian lives. There may be little resistance to divine rebuke. And the little foxes may be the little root of bitterness that troubles the heart. These little foxes may be a little carnality that leads to eventual backsliding. Can you imagine that Solomon that started his race well and he was beloved to God because he allowed little carnality to come into his life. He, 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 got, he got into problem with women. Can you imagine a person marrying 700 wives and 300 concubines? And because he has allowed some little carnality to come into his life, little fleshly lust may also be these little foxes. Little fleshly lust, maybe through the pornography that you have exposed yourself to, that leads to fornication and adultery. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter, chapter 2. Verse 11, dearly beloved, this are, is written to the believers. Those who are who have become children of God, they are saying their names are written in the book of life, but the Lord is warning us. He says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul. These are the little foxes warring against the soul. And the Bible tells us, that these little foxes may also be the little false doctrine, little false teaching that is being swallowed up, maybe from exposure to social media and leading, leading to outright heresy. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 13, Ezekiel chapter 13, the message that is coming from a false doctrine, I mean from false teacher, can be this little fox that can pollute one's life and lead one astray. Ezekiel chapter 13, I read from verse 3. Thus said the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit, and have seen nothing, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. They are cunning, they are crafty, they are sweet coated, they are very charismatic, they can speak in a very sugar coated world to entice people with their false doctrine. You have to be aware. These are little foxes. And the little foxes may be a little worldly association that draws the heart away from God. And by the time one has backslid, he doesn't know. In the book of Hosea chapter 7, I read verse 8. Hosea chapter 7, I read verse 8. Hosea chapter 7, I read verse 8. Ephraim, he has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength. Sinners have devoured his strength. The same partners, they have devoured his strength. And he knoweth it not. Ye great ears are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. When the person has mingled with the world, 
The world has come into his life. He has gone into the world. And these are the little foxes that will draw his heart away from God. And these little foxes may be the little ill temper. Ill temper that leads to hatred and murder. The little unforgiving spirit. And these little foxes may be a little covetousness that leads a person to become a thief. Little covetousness that made Achan to be stealing, to be taking away things that are not supposed to be taken by the people. Or you talk about Gehazi, who, because of covetousness, ran after, after Naaman. The gifts that uh, Elisha did not receive, he went to tell lies to, to, to Naaman that the man of God needed the gift. He got the gift and he got leprosy along with it. He got the gift, he got the judgment of God along with it. Because of covetousness, he got into problem with his life. He couldn't end up with good destiny. And we see these little foxes may be a little self-conceit that leads to arrogance and pride. Absalom, the fact that he was because he's the son of the king, and uh, he took liberty for license. Little conceit, self-conceit came to his heart, he became proud. And you know, the end of Absalom, he died prematurely. He died before his time. And the little foxes may be a little prayer, prayerlessness, little prayerlessness leading to self-management and spiritual blindness. And the little foxes may be the little white lies, as was seen in the life of Abraham. Abraham, he told the lie to cover up himself, and then it happened that Abimelech took Sarah on the basis of the lies that Abraham told him. And you know the consequence, judgment of God came upon Ab Abimelech because of the lies of Abraham. And there's some people justify themselves. They say, at least Abraham was a man of God. He told lies to cover up himself. But when you talk about the consequence, it can be very disastrous. And there uh, some people say, well, but Jacob, he was also God. He got the blessing of God eventually. No, he told lies. Yes, he told lies to Isaac. Isaac was asking, are you a son? He said, yes. And uh, you have brought the food. He said, God has blessed my journey. And he told a lie unto Isaac to steal the blessing. And you know, eventually for 20 years, he was in the foreign land. He suffered for those 20 years. And uh, though God really had mercy upon him, but you know he suffered for 20 years because of the lies he told. And the believer should not be saying, well, the lie I've told is just white lie. Lie is lie. The consequence of lying will make one to end up his journey in hellfire. And uh, we see number three, the different manifestations of other little evils. Different manifestations of other little evils. The Bible talks a lot about little things. Many of them with great consequences. We have heard of the little leaven that leavens the whole lump. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I read verse 6. 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 5, I read verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaven the whole lump? Know ye not that a little leaven, a little leaven of hypocrisy leaven the whole lump? It will defy the life of the Christian. Leaven of false doctrine will leaven and spoil and defile and pollute the life of the believer. These are little, little things that are of terrible, terrible consequences. And we have heard about the little horn in the book of Daniel. Let's look at the book of Daniel, chapter 7. I read verse 8. Daniel even mentioned this little horn about two times, making us to see the danger of the little, little thing. Little horn, Daniel, chapter 7. I read verse 8. Say, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them, among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns clogged up by the roots. And behold, in this horn, this little horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man. The eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things. Can you imagine little horn, but it was speaking things that you ought not to speak. Blasphemy against the Almighty God, doing terrible harm. And when you look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, the second time this little horn is also mentioned. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, and out of one of them came forth a little horn. 
which wants exceedingly great. A little horn which wants exceeding great. Toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. This is the Antichrist, which appearance we have great influence on the world history. And this Antichrist, his appearance will bring the destiny, we affect the destiny of man generally. We also have in the Bible, little foxes of foolish, little foxes of little fire, which also have the potency, like the little foxes, to affect the eternal destiny of man, though they have, they are little in size. The Bible also tells us of little fox, foxes of laziness. In the book of Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, I read from verse 9. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 6, <clears throat> I read from verse 9. How long without sleep, O sluggard? When without arise out of thy sleep, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. That is the situation of the person, the believer. He has more time to sleep. See, when the, he ought to wake up, he say a little more sleep. The time he ought to wake up to have the word of God study, to pray, says a little more sleep. When you ought to rise up and go and serve the Lord and do evangelism, a little more sleep. A little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. What will happen in verse 11? So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. And pray that you not be your faith in Jesus' name. I say, I pray that it not be your aid, your faith in Jesus' name. God wants you to really identify the little foxes. They may be little slumber, little sleep. We have to wake up. And it may be little impatience, as seen in the life of Esau. Esau was hungry. He came back from farming and he saw his brother Jacob, who has got a porridge of me. And then he started begging Jacob, please, can you give me? I'm very hungry. And Esau said, the only condition is that you have to sell your birthright to me. Give me your birthright. And this will say, what is the essence? What's the importance of my birthright? And uh, because of impatience, he could not really just endure to have some self-control. He gave up his birthright and uh, because of porridge of me. And this is a, because of little impatience. You could see how he sold out his birthright. He wanted to get eventually, it was too late. You must not say your birthright because of impatience, your birthright of salvation, your birthright of redemption, because of your belly, because of what you are going to eat and drink. There must be the identification of the little foxes that will hinder us from being able to get to heaven. And I pray all those things that are little foxes today, God will deal with them. God will help you. And God will deliver you from every appearance of these little, little foxes. We are going to second point. Devastating potentials of the evil little family. Devastating potentials of the little evil family. Association of evil little things. We see the foxes, they move together in a company. They move together. And that is what we see when you have these little, little foxes. They move along with others, little, little things. Little abnormal, little behaviors that are negative. Little actions that are negative, that will hinder one from being able to have victory over sin and over the world. These are evil little things that can crawl in, in imperceptibly. You can see it is these little things that injure, injure man the most. We are told about Alexander the Great, who at the age of 33, he conquered the then known world. But when he died, it was not that he was killed in the battle by the sword of the enemy. When he died, it was not that it was a lion that met him and then killed him, but just a little thing, something inconsequential, something insignificant, mosquito, just beat him. And that's what terminated the, the life of this great man, Alexander the, the Great. And so it is in the spiritual life. The things that destroy vital spiritual fiber, and the little things, the things that are seemingly insignificant, things we are allowed to walk in our lives. These are the things God's Spirit is warning all believers about. 
alongside the warning on each of these little evils, the Lord gives us guidance on how to undo each of them. And pray we shall follow that guidelines of the Almighty God so that we can overcome. We can be able to really overcome these little, little foxes. Number one, under this point, defilement by the little foxes. Defilement by the little foxes. Associated with that, number two, damnation by the little folly. Damnation by the little folly. And then associated with this, we also have destruction by the little fire. Number one, defilement by the little foxes. We are saying what little foxes are align this in our lives. It will bring about defilement. The Bible tells us, again, in the book of Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, I read verse 15. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, that define the vines, that corrupt the vines, the vines that ought to bring forth good food, that ought to bring blessing for people, then these little, little foxes come to defy them, to corrupt them, to pollute them. For our vines have tender grapes. As the Lord has given us the, the gift of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, these are tender grapes. And the devil wants to send these little foxes to defy us, to destroy this fruit of the Spirit. And we should really know that when the fruit of the Spirit is taken away, then one's life will be left in orphans of a, a disaster. It will be left in a, in a way of a darkness. When the fruit of the Spirit is not there, the one is barren of this fruit of the Spirit. He has already missed the way to heaven. And is already is getting prepared for eternal judgment in hell fire. And that will not be your Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus expects us to bear fruit of the Spirit. And they say, by their fruit shall know them. If the, fruit is, if the fruit is not there, and you are just having the loud noise of the charisma, and the fruit is not there, then you cannot see yourself being able to enter or gain entrance into heaven. Such trees that are not having the fruit, they be cut down, and they be put in the fire. So we see there is defilement by the little foxes. We should guide against them. Number two, destruction or damnation by the little folly. Damnation by the little folly. In the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, I read verse 1. Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. This little folly symbolized by the dead fly. Just little fly. It can cause the good ointment to lose its good odor and to start to smell in a bad way. And uh, a little folly or a little sin may appear to be seemingly harmless and not exactly destructive, but it is the beginning of damning iniquity. Slothfulness is pleasure, recreation. Might not have been damning for David, David the king, but see what he did to him at last. Others have gone to the battle, to fight the battle of the Lord, but David just wanted to relax in the comfort of his house. And that's how the time of relaxation made his eyes to go in the wrong direction and to look at a woman that ought not to be looked at. And that made him eventually to commit immorality, to commit adultery with this woman. And uh, he eventually also even ended up in killing the man, and the husband of this man, to, I mean, the, the husband of this woman, to, to, to make him to die prematurely. Because of, we see that little sins can make way for great ones. Little sins are destructive as a little termite, as a little termite that enters the furniture and nobody seems to care. And then no little termites just entering to the house. By the time you know what is happening, when he starts working on the furniture, the furniture in the house will be de destroyed because you have allowed it. And uh, you see, the little things are as potentially dangerous as a spark that is carelessly dropped by a lone man on the field. And he just draws the spark of, of fire on the ground and the Grass catches the fire. By the time you know what is happening, 
the huge, it becomes a huge fire that can burn down houses and properties. Little sins sometimes act as burglars, like robbers do. They take along a little boy, a little child, who enters the house through a window that is so small that it will not admit these other older robbers to come in. But this little boy, because he has gained entrance into the house, he goes and opens the door. And so that the robbers, the bigger ones, the more dangerous ones can enter into the house. That is what sin does. Sin, no matter how small, should be feared and avoided as to avoid a snake. The Bible tells us, abstain from all appearance of evil. Not just when the evil has come, but all appearance of evil. Appearance of evil on the social media. Appearance of evil as you are going on the street. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Little impatience, like Saul's impatience, can also make one to be rejected. You can see the case of Saul. Samuel told Saul, wait for me. Before you go to the battle, but Saul said, I cannot wait any longer because the enemies, they were pressing. The Philistines were pressing. There was the pressure. And he took what he is supposed not to do. He went to do it. And as a result of that, God rejected him from being the king. We should not in any way allow this little folly to come into our lives. And we also see number three, destruction by the little fire. Destruction by the little fire. In the book of James, chapter three, I read verse six. James chapter three, I read verse six. And the tongue is a fire. You can see a, the tongue is a fire. Little thing in your mouth is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defile the whole body and set it on fire the cause of nature and is set on fire of hell. That is what the, the way the Bible describes the tongue that is misused. You know, when the tongue is used in the right way to bring glory to God, to bring edification for other people, the, song, the tongue that is used in the right way will bring comfort for those who are in bereavement. But, and you know, for example, when fire is made use of, the fire that is well used can be really doing some wonderful things. I mean, the fire well used, it will bring some, the, warm, warm, the water you have put on the, on the stove to be warmed up and for you to be able to get something good to drink. It can cook your food for you. So, we know that fire may well used can be doing wonderful things, but when it is misused, when fire is misused, it will bring about destruction, brings about devastation of lives and properties. And so we see the tongue of sinners. They can also be terrible. They come in various forms. The tongue of sinners can be like, the, can be described as flattering tongue, flattering tongue. In the book of Psalm, Chapter nine, chapter five, I read verse nine. Psalm chapter five, I read verse nine. Psalm chapter five, I read verse nine. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter with their tongue. They flatter with their tongue. That's the tongue of sinners, tongue of backsliders. And also look at Psalm chapter 10, verse seven. It, what does the Bible describe the tongue of sinners, tongue of backsliders? The, Psalm chapter 10, I read verse 7. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He curses the husband, curses the children, curses the people in the family, in the, in the household. And his, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. And that's the tongue of sinners. And also his described as a proud tongue. In the book of Psalm chapter 12, verse 3, Psalm 12, verse 3, the Lord shall cut off of flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. The Lord will cut off all the flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. And it's also described as deceitful tongue. Deceitful tongue, backbiting, gossiping tongue, sharp tongue. We also describe the tongue of sinners as Line tongue, line tongue, and also perverse tongue. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, I read verse 3. Proverbs, chapter 13, I read verse 3. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. 
you will not have destruction in Jesus' name. I say you will not have destruction in Jesus' name. But you have to take care how you make use of your lips. You make use of your tongue. He that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. Don't just be a person, just be talkative, talking, talking, talking like a parrot. Know how to watch over and tame the tongue. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. In the book of Proverbs 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, verse 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. And that was why the psalmist was asking the question. In the book of Psalm 120, verse 3. Psalm 120, I read verse 3. He was asking this in very important question. In Psalm 120, verse 3. What shall I be given unto thee? What shall be done unto thee, thou first tongue? How can I be able to make this tongue to be tamed? How can I make use of this tongue in the right way? That is the question. And then the answer was given in the book of Psalm 39, verse 1. How can we be able to tame the tongue? How can we make use of this tongue in the right way? The way that you glorify the name of the Lord. Psalm 39, I read verse 1. I said, I will take it to my ways, that I will not sin with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And that's why the word of God tells us we must discipline this tongue. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. How do we keep this tongue? How do we get this tongue in the right direction? In the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, I read verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 3, I read verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guy. Do you want long life of good health? Want long life of success? Long life of serving the Lord? And you want to see good days, not evil days. You want to see good days, not days of calamity. You must refrain your tongue from evil. And your lips, they don't speak guy. There will not be hypocrisy upon the lips. And that's why we need to submit this tongue to the control of the Holy Spirit. And need to pray over this tongue regularly. Let this tongue be a channel of blessing to your life and other lives. Now we're going to look at the last point. We have already seen the devastating, destructive uh, as, uh, potentials of the little, little foxes and the associated family of the little foxes. Now we are going to look at the third point, deliverance from the pollutions of the little foxes. How can we de de deliver? How can we be free from the pollutions of the little foxes? In the book of Titus, chapter 2, I read verse 11. Titus, chapter 2, I read verse 11. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth deliverance that appear to all men. The grace of God that bringeth holiness has appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth total freedom has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly. We should live righteously. We should live godly in this present world. It's not when we live, when we die and we depart from this world that we can live godly, live righteously. Overcome these little, little foxes is why we are still in this present world. We can overcome because the grace of God is here. And I believe today that grace will be manifest in your life. It's the grace of God that brings deliverance. We're going to look at these three points under this subject. Number one, determined resolution to be free from sin. Determined resolution to be free from sin. Number two, definite decision of the wise to heed God's counsel. Definite decision of the wise to heed God's counsel. And number three, deliberate dedication of bodily members to God. Deliberate dedication of bodily members to God. Number one, determined resolution to be free from sin. Today, you must have a determination, a deliberate determination that I want to be free from all the effects 
and the manifestation and presence of the little, little foxes. There must be a determination. Because as you replace the little foxes with little faith, you can overcome. As you replace the little foxes, the little follies, with the little faith, you can overcome. As you really overcome and you replace the little slumber with little faith, you can overcome. As you replace the little fire of the tongue with a little faith, you can overcome. Now, in the book of Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, I read verse 20. Matthew chapter 17, I read verse 20. Matthew chapter 17, I read verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for very near son to you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, little faith. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, very little seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and ye shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Amen. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. If you have faith, just little faith, you can say to this mountain of the little foxes, go out of my life, I don't want you anymore. You can say to the mountain of little follies to really get out of your life. The mountain of little slumber, the mountain of little uh, uh, fire of the tongue to get out, to be quenched, and the Lord will do it. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Mark 11, verse 22. And Jesus answering says unto them, Have faith in God. My friend, have faith in God. All things are possible to them that believe. And he said in verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which is here shall come to pass, he shall have whatever you say. With this little faith, you can be able to get the mountain of these little foxes being removed, being cast away. Jesus said, uh, he told us about, we are told about the case of that man, centurion man who came to Jesus Christ. And he said, my servant is healed and be sick. Can you just come and pray for him? But Jesus, he couldn't come at that time. And the man said, you don't even need to come to my house. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. But I know you are a man of authority. Just speak the word only. Speak the word only. I know my servant shall be healed. And I believe today, as you speak the word to God, and you call upon God, God of heaven will give attention to your prayer. And the little foxes shall have to really vanish. They have to disappear from your life. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 18. Romans chapter 6, I read verse 18. Romans 6, verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Yes, today is a day of freedom. Day of freedom from sin. Day of freedom from the little foxes. Day of freedom from the little follies. Day of freedom from the little uh, fire that has really been working serious evil on your life. Today, you can be able to be free. As you are free from sin, you become a servant of righteousness. No more a servant of sin, no more a servant of the little foxes, but to become a servant of the law. Verse 22, but now be made free from sin. Not when you have died, you can be made free from sin now. Now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Praise the Lord. You become a servant to God. You become a real child of God. You become a disciple of the Lord. Become an ambassador for the Almighty God and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Everlasting life is your portion in Jesus' name. Don't excuse sin. Don't in any way pamper sin, however small it may be. Don't cover up the sin. The Bible tells us anyone who covers up his sin, he cannot prosper. And I know you want to prosper. I know you want to make progress. I know you want it to be well with you, with your family. Now and in the future. But if you cover up sin, cover up the little follies, cover up the little foxes, you say it doesn't matter. You cover up the little fire and say it doesn't matter. You cannot prosper. But if you confess and forsake them, you shall take the mercy. If you confess and forsake them, you shall be cleansed. 
by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you confess and forsake them, you shall be purified and your life shall be such that you bring glory to the name of the Lord. Be sure you are born again. If you have not been sure of your salvation, today you can be sure that you can give your life to Jesus Christ. Because if any man is in Christ, he becomes a new creature. All things will pass away. All things, the little foxes, they will pass away. All things, the little, the little foxes, they will pass away. All things, the little fire kindled by the untamed tongue, they will pass away. And all things shall become new. That, that's why you must be born again. If the foundation of being born again is not there, today you can have that foundation laid. And so that you can have a life that is profitable for the glory of the Lord, and you can fulfill your destiny. Number two, definite decision of the wise to heed God's counsel. Definite decision of the wise to heed God's counsel. God's counsel is to remove the little foxes that destroy the vines and maintain the life of victory over them. Like every good thing, we should guide jealously the great future that God has preserved for us. How do we really defend our grand destiny? How do we achieve this great destiny that God is having for us? Number one, there must be regular character examination. Every day, let there be regular examination of our character. In 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 13, I read verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Examine yourselves, whether you are in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, you will not be a reprobate. Say, I will not be a reprobate. Therefore, there must be constant examination of our character. Every time, in the morning, in the evening, especially when you are about to sleep in the day, in the night, examine the day, how you will be able to go about the work of the day, interactions you have gone, and the relationship you have had during the day, things that you have said during the day, examine this in the light of the word of God. And the word of God, which is the mirror, will show you what is the situation and what needs to be put right. Number two, there must be regular quiet time. Regular quiet time. In the book of Psalm chapter 5, I read from verse 1. Psalm chapter 5, I read from verse 1. Psalm 5 from verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hacking on to the voice of my cry. My King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and we look up. That's the testimony of the psalmist. The testimony of such a person who wants to see that he, he fulfills his destiny. He defends the grand destiny God has given to him. He doesn't want to miss the way to heaven. There must be that constant relationship with the Almighty God, constant fellowship. Not just fellowship of just uh, three minutes, five minutes, just pray, and then you read some portion of the Bible, and then rush away to your place of work, there must be real, genuine fellowship with the Lord. Have time to read the Bible, study the Word of God, and have time to pray. Let God speak to you through His Word, and you also speak to God as your Father. That's how you remain. You receive the grace. You receive the strength to overcome temptations that come along the way. Because without Him, we can do nothing. We need to really have that dependency upon Him through a time of devotion, the quiet time every day. Number three, yielding promptly to the faithful but gentle warning of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit be warning us because if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, doesn't belong to him, but once you belong to Jesus, the Spirit of God comes into you. He'll be giving you caution, be directing you, warning you that this thing you want to do, you shouldn't do it. This thing you want to lay your hands upon, don't tamper with it. This thing you want to say, avoid it. Because as you are really promptly and yielding to the faithful and gentle warning of the Holy Spirit, you will surely overcome. You'll be able to maintain the life of victory. And number, number four, make yourself accountable to a spiritual mentor. Make yourself accountable to a spiritual mentor. You can see the case of Peter. Peter, thank God that he had the mentor, Jesus Christ, the perfect one, as the mentor, as the director, as the leader for him. And so when 
he was to go astray, Jesus told him, cautioned him, and prayed for him so that the devil will not swallow up Peter, will not swallow up his experiences. He will not really scatter the life of Peter. Do you have such a spiritual mentor? Do you have a spiritual mentor that can be able to guide and counsel you? In the book of uh, Luke chapter 22, I read verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. Luke 22, I read verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, thou shalt strengthen thy brethren. The Lord Jesus, the perfect mentor, Peter was able to get the guidance and direction and the prayer of his mentor. And therefore, the devil could not have the ownership of Peter. I pray that the devil will not have the ownership of your life in Jesus' name. Number four and number five, be sober, be vigilant, be prayerful. Be sober, be vigilant, and be very prayerful. In the book of First Peter chapter 5, I read verse 8. First Peter chapter 5, I read verse 8. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's the caution, that's the warning of the word of God, the counsel of God. Be sober, be vigilant, be prayerful. Especially, you must know how to make the profitable and cautious use of social media. Be vigilant. How you look into, how you browse the, the things that you want to browse on the social media. There are some ungodly things that just pop up like that. If you are not prayerful, if you are not sober, if you are not vigilant, you can be captured by these things that are little, little foxes from the social media. And we see number six, make regular use of the, of the various uh, means of grace that God has provided for all. Make regular use of the means of grace that God has provided for all. In the book of Second uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Second Corinthians chapter 12, I read verse 9. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Hallelujah. God's grace is sufficient for you. In the time of temptation, you can overcome because you depend upon the grace of God. The grace of God that teaches us to live soberly, live righteously, to live in the holiness as we are in this present world. This grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my families that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The time when the enemy comes in like a flood, depend upon the grace of the Lord to make you to overcome and make use of this means of grace that God has provided for all. Number seven, set your affections on heavenly things. Set your affections on the things that matter, the things that are of eternal value, upon heavenly things. Set your affections upon heavenly things. In the book of Colossians chapter three, I read from verse one. Colossians chapter three from verse one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are bound. We are Christ seated, on the right hand of God, set your affection where on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your affections on things that are of heaven, things that are of eternal value. Don't be really setting your affection on things of this because this world is passing away. We are here temporarily. You must really set your affection on the things of heaven, where Jesus Christ is seated. In verse 3, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And so we see that you can be delivered from the pollutions of the little foxes. And lastly, deliberate dedication of our bodily members unto God. Deliberate dedication of our bodily members unto God. In the book of Romans chapter 6, I read from verse 11. Romans chapter 6, I read from verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but our life unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but our life unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the laws thereof. This is a deliberate decision that you must not allow sin to reign in your mortal body. Don't allow any, any, any little folks to come near your to come near to your mind, to come near to you. Don't allow little folly to come into your life. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the laws thereof. Neither ye be your members as instruments of right unrighteousness unto sin, but ye yourselves unto God. Ye the members of your body unto God. Your eyes ye it unto God. Not just looking at anything, any object, the polluted thing on the screen, in the social media, on the streets. Make sure your eyes is yielded unto God as instrument of righteousness. Your ears, you can't just listen to any kind of music. Don't listen to music that you now make you to be carrying about and be a carrier of a little, little folly, little, little fire, little, little foxes. And don't in any way use your hand for anything. Don't dip your hand into anything of sin. Don't allow your hand to do things that we make heaven to be unhappy about your life. He says, yield your mem yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of, of righteousness unto God. Your members, your feet should take you not to wrong places, but your feet should take you to places where you can be able to be built up and your life can be profitably spent for the glory of God. Let your feet take you to those people that are in need of the gospel. Those people who need the, the Lord Jesus Christ and share the word of God with them. And let your mind, your, your memory, not be fixed on the things that will defy your mind. Your heart, your hands, your ears, your hand, your tongue, every member of your body, yield this unto God as instruments of righteousness, not more to be instruments of unrighteousness. Then verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Say that. Sin shall not have dominion over me. The little, little foxes will not have dominion over me. Say it. The little folies will not have dominion over me. Little fire of the tongue will not have dominion over me. All these little, little things will not have dominion over me. The Bible tells us, look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. And then the book of Chapter Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, I read verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies, your eyes present to God, present your ears to God, present your tongue unto God as living sacrifice, present your imagination, your mind unto God, Present your leg, your feet unto God. Present your hand unto God. Present your brain unto God as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let there be transformation in your life by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is the Challenge that God is giving to us. This is the counsel of the Almighty God. This is the wise counsel from the scriptures. How we can be able to be delivered and maintain a deliverance from the little, little foxes and how we can be kept from all the pollutions of this world. This morning, the Lord is really challenging us that we should really come unto him and allow him to have his way in our lives. And we should come to them. I want us to rise up and go to the Lord in prayer and let God have his way. Let the word of God have his way. Let the Holy Spirit show us where things have gone wrong. The things that are the little, little foxes in our lives, the little follies in our lives, those little, little slumber, those little, little lies, those little, little covetousness that have really ravaged our lives and is destroying our spiritual life destroying our destiny, hindering us from being able to make progress spiritually. Open your mouth and confess them to the Lord. Tell the Lord that he should have mercy. He should come and apply his blood to come and cleanse you from all these little, little 
foxes, all these things that we think they are insignificant, but they have mighty consequences, terrible consequences if you allow them. If you don't really get rid of them, then they will bring disaster, destruction, damnation, doom upon anyone that is still carrying this about. Today, Jesus is calling you to come to Calvary and say, Lord, I want you to wash me, cleanse me from any entanglement with these little, little foxes. I want to be free. I want to be totally free. The Bible says, if the Son shall make you free, we shall be free indeed. If you are not yet born again, if you are not saved, today is the day of salvation. Today you can become a new creature and say, Lord, come and save me. Transform my life, change my life, make me to become a new creature. And if you are a Christian, you are just up and down, you are never stable, you are not steadfast. You are up today, down tomorrow. Because of these little, little foxes, today you can be totally free. You can be completely free. You can say to these little, little foxes, by the word of God, get out of my life. I don't want you anymore. I want total freedom. I want to live a life that overcomes, to overcome sin, to overcome the devil, to overcome the world. I want to get to heaven. I don't want the door of heaven to be closed against me. Because the word of God says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. If you have been defied and polluted by the little, little foxes, how can you be able to see God on the final day? If you have been defied by these little, little things, little, little foxes, how can the door of heaven be open to you when you leave this world? So today is the day of deliverance, the day of salvation. And you can claim the victory. You can claim the victory and dominion over all these little, little foxes. Today, you can have total victory. As you have come to the Lord, as you have told the Lord to come and really save you, the Lord is doing it. I want us to pray now. I want us to really pray together. And I know as we pray, God will do the wonders in your life. Father, we thank you. Father, we praise your name. We glorify thee because Jesus Christ was manifested on the cross at Calvary to take away our sin. And in him there is no sin. Lord, I thank you because your will is for us to be totally free from sin. Oh, Lord, so that heaven can be our home. Father, I'm praying in the name of Jesus as your word has gone out this morning and we have repented and we have really decided to forsake all the association with the little foxes, association with the little follies, association with the little, little fire that are really consuming our spiritual lives, association with all those evils that have defied us as we are repenting of them. I pray that you forgive us in Jesus' name. Come and cleanse us and purify our hearts and pray in the name of Jesus, as many as are not born again, let them be born again. Let them become new creatures. Let them become children of God. All things will pass away and all things will become new. Praying for every believer that is really not been having the victory over these little, little foxes. Today, let the victory be their portion. In Jesus' name, I'm praying that there will be sanctification for every believer. There will be total purification of our heart. Our hearts will be circumcised. And so that we can be able to love God with all our heart, with all our power, with all our strength. And we can be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Father, I'm praying that you help us. So that we shall continue to live the victorious life. Until the Lord shall come. And so when the Lord shall come, on the final day, we shall not be ashamed to meet you at your coming. Thank you, mighty God, for your answer our prayers. Glory be to your name in the highest. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you.
Praise the Lord. Everybody over there, I said, Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for another session again because Christ Jesus, our Savior, Lord, is inexhaustible. And we come now, Lord, to listen to what you have to say, Father, about Jesus, the all sufficient. Savior, all sufficient Redeemer, all sufficient Lord, and we pray you keep us awake, even in the condition physical in which we are, and we pray that the knowledge of Christ will increase, will go deeper, higher, further in every life in Jesus' name. Confirm the truth of Christ. The worthiness of Christ. The goodness of Christ in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Another amen. A good amen to show you are not tired of Jesus. God bless you. You can see now. Once again, we're coming to the scriptures. We're coming to the revelation of God concerning Jesus. He is the just king with love 
and might. Jesus, the just king, what love and might. In Zechariah chapter 9, reading from verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of the of an ass. We're talking about Jesus, and here is revealed to us as the one that reigns is the reigning king, and he is just. He comes with love. He comes with might. And he comes with love for everyone to do in every life what only he, the just king, can do. Look at Revelation chapter 15, reading from verse 3. It says, And they sang, the, the, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Here again, it's revealed to us the Lamb of God, the one who is just, is the one who is the King. The king of saints. It says in verse 4, who? In verse 4, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name for thou only art holy? For all nations shall come and worship before thee for thy judgments made manifest Jesus the just Jesus the king Jesus the lover of your soul Jesus the might and the power of God put everything together the just king with love and might we're looking at uh, four things here that goes with J, K, L, and M. Number one, Jesus, the just, the sinless, spotless, savior. Number two, Jesus, the king of kings, higher than the highest sovereign. Number three, Jesus, the lamb of God, supreme, sacrificing for our sins, supreme sacrifice, for sin. Number four, Jesus, the mighty God with supernatural spirit, the supernatural strength of the spirit. Look at number one. Number one is Jesus, the just, the sinless, spotless savior. Sinless, spotless savior. What told in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For as much as she know, if you didn't know, you ought to know. Now you know, for as much as she know, that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from, by tradition, from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It tells us in First John chapter 3, verse 5, about this same Jesus, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him, in Christ, in the Savior, in the Redeemer, 
in a spotless one, in a sinless one, in him is no sin. We need to know what who Christ is and what Christ means for every one of us. Jesus, the just, the sinless, the spotless Savior. Look at three things here. Number one, Jesus, the Savior from all sins. Number two, Jesus, the justifier of all who surrender and separate from sin. Number three, Jesus, the judge of all, all scoffers, all sinners, all saints, all servants. He is the judge. By him, all our actions are waged in the perfect balance of God. Look at number one there, Jesus, the Savior from all sin. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, and she shall bring forth his son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save. He, no other one, he is the one that has the power and the finality of power. He shall save his people from their sins. If you are not saved from sin, you are not one of his people. If you are still diving into the ocean of sin, if you are still swimming in the sea of sin, if you are still swallowing all the sins around you, and you are living a sinful life, you are not one of his people. You can belong to any church, any denomination, any assembly that doesn't make you one of the people of God, what makes you a child of God and what makes you one of his people is that you are saved. You allow him to save you from all your sins. We're told in John chapter 1 verse 29 and when and the next day John said Jesus, that's him, that's our savior. Come in unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. When you have contact with Christ, contact with Jesus, contact with the Savior, what he does in your life is that he looks at all your life, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your, your character, your behavior, everywhere. He searches everywhere and he takes sin away from you. All the sins of the world, all the sins of our neighbors, all the sins of society, all the sins that were met in the world and entered into us when you meet Jesus, he takes away your sin and you live a life free from sin while you are here in the world. In First John chapter 3, chapter 3, reading from verse 5, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin, verse 6. In verse 6, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever, whatever his name, whosoever whatever her name, whosoever, whatever his position, whosoever, whatever his authority, whosoever, whatever his testimony, whosoever, whatever, he may go around proclaiming about himself, whosoever sinners has not seen him. That's why we don't uh, give unnecessary hypocritical honor to people who are sinning against Christ, who are sinning despite the sacrifice of Christ, and we don't exalt them for making a rubbish of Calvary. 
Christ came and the great thing he came to do is so that he will take sin away from us and take us away from sin. And anyone, anywhere, with any position, authority, religious position, religious authority that lives in sin, in defiance of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, we don't give a pinch of salt and we don't give any iota of honor to the one who dishonors Calvary, anyone. Because whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Look at verse 7 there. In verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even he as he is righteous. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, he that committeth sin. Tell me. Read it from your Bible. Read it out aloud. He, whoever, anywhere, he, whoever, whatever control, authority the person may seem to have, and you're not going to submit to Christ and submit to the enemy of Christ at the same time. You're not going to submit to the Savior and the adamant sinner at the same time, he says, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil in your life. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Look at number two there. Number two is Jesus, the justifier of all who surrender and separate from sin. He is the justifier. Look at uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 26. In Romans chapter 3, verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier. is just and he is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. If you have not tasted the justification, it's here for you today. It will justify you. It will cleanse you. It will make you a brand new creature. That your life will be totally different, higher than your life of the past. Look at chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. It says in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, But to him that walketh not, to him that are giving up, trying, laboring, sweating, so that he can set himself free because he knows it's an impossible job. You cannot lift up yourself by the straps of the boots that you wear. And you cannot take yourself to heaven by anything that you do. And so, you know, there is no way, there's no freedom, there's no justification coming through that path. And wisely, you leave that path because he is the one that justifies the people who are not working for salvation, but they are believing for salvation. That believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. His faith is counted for righteousness. We go to number three. Number three is the judge of all. The Adusu scoff is the judge of the scoffers. The Adusu scorn 
He is the judge of the scorners. There are those who sin deliberately. They know that God commands against this. They know this is the way of righteousness. Walk ye therein. And they say, we will not walk therein. And deliberately, they sin against the evident commandment of the Lord. Some sin by weakness. Some sin by depravity. Some sin by their will. To say, I know that's right. I know God wants that. I know Jesus died for that. But by their set will, the sin by their will. However, anybody says, and he refuses to repent, he is the judge of all. The scoffers, the scorners, the sinners, the saints, and the servants. He judges all. In John chapter 5, reading from verse 22, John chapter 5, verse 22, for the Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. The Father has delegated the Father has committed all judgment of all people in every generation. The Father has committed all judgment unto Christ. And he is the Christ who knows all things. He knows all things about all people in every generation. And he judges according to the revealed truth of what our lives have been. We can come to him today and allow him to take away the sin. Or somebody may continue and continue adamant, rebellious, willful in sin until there is no remedy. I pray You'll be wise. I will be wise. I will not be a scoffer. I'll not be a scorner. I'll not be an Adamite. You know that word Adamite comes from Adam. Adamite. Adamant sinner. I'll not be an Adamant sinner. But you'll be somebody who is absolutely surrendered unto Christ. Because it's in that surrender, it's in that submission, it's in that giving yourself to the only Savior that brings the salvation of the Lord to you today. And then you escape the judgment of God eventually. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, K. Jesus, the King of Kings, higher than the highest sovereign on earth. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, reading from chapter 5, reading from verse 8, it says, If thou seest oppression, of the poor, the oppression of the poor, and violate perversion, perverting of judgment and justice in a province, any part of the world. It says, Marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be. A higher person, personality than the Christ. The King, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is the one higher than the highest. 
and you come to him, you bend to him, you bow to him, you submit to him as the king of kings, higher than the highest sovereign. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the king said and seated a sovereign. Number two, the king of saints, the surpassing of surpassing splendor. Number three, the king with the scepter of supremacy. Look at number one. Number one, Christ Jesus, the king said and seated as sovereign. In Psalm 2, reading from verse 6, Psalm 2, reading from verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That the Almighty, that the Most High, that's God in heaven, saying, affirming that he, the Almighty, has set Jesus as king upon his holy hill. Ah, pastor, preacher. You see Jesus. I can't find Jesus there. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And he says of that son, I have said, my king, the son, Jesus, upon my holy hill of Zion. He is the sage, seated, sovereign, king, king of kings. What are we to do? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Kiss the Son, honor the Son, love the Son, bench before the Son. You see, in those days, even, here, even in our world now, this generation, it, it is a culture where when somebody gives the highest honor, he'll bend down and kiss the foot or the feet of the one that he honors. That's why it says, bend low. Bench down. Humble yourself. Come as a pleading sinner and bench before the Son of God. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. I'm believing that you're putting your trust in Christ. I said I'm believing that you're putting your trust in Christ. Savior and Lord, judge and king. Look at number two here. Number two, the king of saints in surpassing splendor. He is the king of saints in surpassing splendor. We're told in Revelation chapter 15, and I'm reading there from verse 3, the king of saints. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. The king of saints. You discover that believers are called saints in the New Testament. They're not called sinners. When they believe, they believe in Christ. Their sins are blotted out. Their sins are cleansed away. The sins are forever gone and they are transformed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a renewed creature, a reformed creature, a renewed creature. If any man be in Christ, he is 
If he's really in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. In that newness of life, the believer is called saint. And when you become a saint like that, not when you are dead, when you are still alive, it becomes your king. It's the king of saints. And he has surpassing splendor over your life, in your life, and through your life. Oh, we're looking at number three here. Number three, he is the king or the scepter of supremacy. The king or the scepter of supremacy. Hebrews chapter one, we're looking at verse eight. Hebrews chapter one. Reading from verse 8, but unto the Son, he says, unto the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. That's talking about Christ. And then in verse 9, it says in verse 9, but uh, thou as Lord righteousness and hated iniquity. He loves righteousness. Why? Is Christ the righteous? Why? Is Christ that came to establish righteousness in the heart of his followers? Why? Is the one who has been righteous from all eternity. He loves righteousness. He hates anything. That contradicts that righteousness. God doesn't have favorites. That he'll say, I know him. I know the life is bad. I know the life is sinful. But all the same is my favorite. No. No. A thousand times. A million times. No. He loves righteousness. And it says he hates iniquity. Anywhere that is found. The one that deliberately goes into iniquity. And it says, I'm the favorite of God. And so I can do whatever. You will discover to your dismay. That God is no respecter of persons. And Christ loves righteousness. Anywhere, in anyone, it's found. And Jesus hates iniquity in whomsoever that is found. Therefore, God, even my God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's our king. The king that has the scepter. Of righteousness. Let's go to the next point now. We're looking at El Jesus, the Lamb of God, the supreme sacrifice for sin. We're told in John, John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him. And says, behold, stop everything and look at this one. Behold, and turn away from everything and look at this one. Because any other thing you look at cannot prepare you for eternity. Any other thing you look at cannot change your life and make you qualified to enter heaven. Stop everything. Turn away from everything. Disregard every other thing. Behold, the Lamb of God will take us away from the sin, the sin of the world. He'll take all your sins away. But you must look at him. You must look by faith. You must focus on him. You must behold him. Behold, the Lamb of God will take us away the sin of the the world. There are three things we're considering. Number one, the Lamb for salvation for all sinners. Number two, the light shining 
beyond the sun, beyond the stars. Number three, the Lord over all saints and over all subjects, all citizens. Look at number one. Number one, the Lamb for salvation for all sinners. The Lamb for salvation. For all sinners. It tells us in Revelation chapter 5. Reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 5 verse 8. And when he had taken the book. The four beasts, living creatures. And the four and twenty elders representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the New Testament representing the old and the new 24. And the 24 elders, they fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden veils full of the odors which are the prayers of the saints. What are they saying? Look at verse 9. In verse 9, and a song, a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, the book of the redemption of the whole earth, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and has redeemed us unto God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's our Savior. That's the King. That's the Lamb. And the salvation he has, he has given, is for everyone out of every kindred, every tongue, every language. And people, every community, tribe of people, and every nation. Look at number two. Number two is the light shining beyond the sun and the stars. The sun shining. The stars shining. And he is above them all. The shining light. Look at John chapter 8 verse 12. John 8 verse 12. It says, When then speak he Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. The light of the sun can give you some physical light to see around you, of the moon, of the stars. But all those sources of light only give you light here on earth. Here is the one that goes beyond them, shines beyond them. And here is the one that takes you beyond the sun, beyond the stars. Here, Jesus, the light of the world. He says, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. He that followeth me. Followeth me the light shall not walk in darkness. Any other, any other a kind of realm you are walking, if it's secret, if it's darkness, if it's something you have to cover up under the shade of the dark night, you are not of God. If you have God, you have repented. You have turned away from all the works of darkness, all the powers of darkness, all the things that show darkness, the people who have not come to the light that they do. 
you are not of God. But when you come to Christ, and the light of Christ shines inside you, it says you follow him, and you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. A good amen there. That's why he said, let your light so shine. The people around you will manifest shady deal, dark deals, and dark behavior. The people around you will live and say, uh, people must not see this, people must not know this. And as you live in the midst of those people, as you live and work in your office, anywhere you are, as you mingle around people you know and people you don't know, you want to be a shiny star. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three is the Lord over all saints and over all subjects. The Lord over all saints and over all subjects. In Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 36. Acts 10, reading from verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Peace, peace with God, by Jesus Christ. Peace, peace on the inside, in your soul. No condemnation, no confusion, no damnation. And in your heart, there is peace. Peace in preaching peace, peace in your home, with your wife, with your husband, transparent, deep, true, faithful, not hypocritical, not a make-believer, not, let me keep quiet so that I don't disturb him, I don't disturb her, so there is peace, not that kind, the peace that goes beyond every hypocrisy and goes beyond every superficial covering that people have through him. Jesus will preach peace and peace with our neighbors, peace with everyone. There is no infighting. There's no psychological fighting. There's no diplomatic fighting. There is no uh, fighting for supremacy among the real people of God. He gives us peace. Peace with your neighbors. He gives us peace from tribe to tribe. Tribe between one tribe and the other tribe. When we know Christ... The priest of peace, he gives us peace. And he says, preaching peace, proclaiming peace, and having peace by, the, by Jesus Christ, who you see, look at that bracket, he is the Lord of all. He is the Lord of all. We come to the next point here, point number four. This is the M, Jesus the mighty God with supernatural strength of the Spirit. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm reading there from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god that's his name the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says of the increase of his kingdom and his peace 
There shall be no end upon the throne of David, of the king, upon his kingdom. It says to order it. When it comes to your life, it takes disorderliness away. And it brings order into your life. It brings some good order. That your life is not disorderly anymore because he, this Christ, this Jesus, this mighty God, brings order. He says to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, from now, from today, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this in your life. Amen. Look at three things here. Number one, the Messiah with satisfactory sacrifice for sin. The Messiah with sacri uh, satisfactory sacrifice for sin. Number two, he is the mediator, the source of salvation for sinners. Number three, the master who served a servant to show servants the standard. Look at number one. Number one, he is the Messiah. In Daniel chapter 9, reading from verse 24. Daniel chapter 9, we're reading from verse 24. It says, 70 years, sorry, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish transgression. The Messiah, that's what he came to do, to finish transgression, to put an end to, to transgression, to make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. And it says to bring everlasting righteousness, not intermittent righteousness. Righteous on Sunday, righteous on Monday, righteous on the festival day, unrighteous on the ordinary day, righteous most of the days of their lives, of the least of their lives, or righteous most of the days of their lives. And you know, those, um, you know, they are up on Sunday and down during the week, they are up in the public and they are down in the private. No, those ones have not tasted the reason why the Messiah came. He is to put an end. Make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the holy, the most holy. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says, No, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until unto the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah, the one that will come and put an end to sin, the one that will come and establish righteousness in every soul, every heart that believes in him, the Messiah, the Prince, shall be 70 weeks and three score and two weeks. And it says, the streets shall be built again. And the wall, even in troublous times. He is the Messiah, and he is the one who has come, so that all our sins are washed away. What a wonderful thing to know him. And then after we know him, our lives are no longer 
the same. First Corinthians chapter 5. Reading from verse 7. First Corinthians chapter 5. Reading from verse 7. It says, Porch out therefore the old leaven that she may be a new lamb as she are unleavened. For even Christ, a Passover, the Messiah, even Christ, the Passover, the Messiah, is sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice. Believers who have known Christ, they do not hold malice. What's malice? If the inside seated hatred the people have for what he has done against them. What's malice? If the seated hatred and emosity in the heart for what he is doing against me. What's malice? The hatred, the evil that people have in their heart for the suspicion. He may do something. He has not done it. I'm suspecting him. He may say something about me. He may do something against me. Before he does it, they have the hatred. They have the malice. And they have the seated animosity and evil planning against him for what he has done, for what he is doing now, and for what he may do against them. It says, when you have experienced the Messiah, when you have experienced Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice, you lay aside everything that is of malice or wickedness. But let's keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity, of honesty, of transparency, and truth. We're coming to number two here. Number two, he is the mediator, the source of of salvation for sinners. Here is Jesus presented to us from all areas and all sides. He is the mediator. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. It says, But now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, more excellent than the ministry of Moses. More excellent than the ministry of Aaron. More excellent than the ministry of the old covenant priests. Now, I see you change a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. There's no other covenant. That, uh, that's comparable with the covenant we have in God with God through Christ. And there's no other covenant will come. He has made the final covenant. He has made the fullest covenant. He has made the foremost covenant. And it's a better covenant that he has made which was based and established upon uh, better promises. All we need, we now find in Christ. All you need, you now find in Christ. Amen. amen. You know, when you say amen, I know you have not fallen asleep because you know sometimes, you know, when you listen to uh, the voice of a preacher, it's like, you know, a good song you are listening to and just put some people to sleep, you will not sleep. Amen. Amen. Now we have this better covenant and the reality of it be fulfilled in every one of your lives in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three here is the master who served a servant to show 
all his servants the standard of service. The standard of service. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you. That's why we came to him. He wants to take away the old mind we had. The old mindset we have. You understand? It's what you construct in your mind that you bring out in life. It takes place in your mind first. And when you have the mind of the world, the mind of tradition, the mind of religion, the mind of, allow me, that they are mommy. When I was growing up, I used to see what my dad was doing. He wasn't born again at the time I was talking about. And there were things he did. It was a strong mind. He wasn't a soldier, but he had the mind of a soldier. Determined. And if he said, this I will do. He never forgot. I know that man. He was my father. Action, attitude, life, relationship. And he knew oh, my father was clever. He could smile and you see his teeth as he grins. But what he was going to do, he had a strong mind. That's what he would do. Yeah, there are people that still have the mind of their father. On the other hand, my mother, of blessed glory, I'm not seeing anything that will, nothing can hurt her where she is, but my mother, even the facial appearance, gentle and soft and nice and inviting. If you did anything against her, she didn't lose a smile, but because I was the firstborn, if she'll tell me, he'll say, he call me by, you know, the name is, he loves to call me. And he'll say, you know what? That person does not understand, but I'll show him. And true, she will show that person. And when I was growing up, I came to a crossroad. I'm going into life. And I saw the picture before me, what the Lord will make me to become in Christ. And I ask myself, what mind do I want to carry from here? The mind of my dad, the mind of my mom, and I decided there's a better mind, the mind of Christ. Somebody give me a good amen. amen. And with all the love and all the respect, I have I had and still have for dad and mom. I chose to drop the mind of dad and mom. And now to take on the mind of Christ. And you come to the crossroad. You can take the mind of that hero, the mind of that leader, the mind of that person that. They can have the undercurrent of evil under the carpet. And then above the carpet, they can look as nice as any pretender can be. If that's your choice, eternity will close its door against your butt. When you drop all that mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, who? Being the form of God, sought it not to be robbery, to be equal with God. Then in verse 7, in verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation. That's the problem. The people want to have reputation. They want to have human honor. And they want to kind of Organize everybody, every event around them to give them that honor. 
And if there is an isolated man, isolated woman that says all the honor I can give, I give to Christ. In fact, I don't have enough. If I have a thousand tongues, I will sing only one song to the praise of my Redeemer. When you see somebody there who does not want to help them to maintain the high level reputation they're looking for, then they show their real mind. But all the same, we look at Christ who made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of his servant. He was found, he was made in the likeness of men. And then in verse 8, we're told, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. God did not humble him, he humbled himself. The events surrounding him did not humble him, he humbled himself. And when we follow after the path of Christ, and we have the mind of Christ, we don't want, we don't wait for, you know, a pastor somewhere to come and humble us, humiliate us, we can do that by ourselves. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. And now that's the reason why God the Father has highly exalted him. And you want exhortation through exhortation, eternal exhortation. You humble yourself before the Lord. And then you come to Christ. And all the attributes of Christ, and all the goodness of Christ, all the graciousness of Christ, you'll have in your life from today in Jesus' name. I will have. I will have. Why can't I hear you? Because I will ask. Because I will ask. Because I will ask. The Lord grant you the very mind of Christ from today till you see him face to face in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer so that the resource higher make us what we ought to be, which we have not been. Let's talk to the Lord Jesus so that he'll give us a very heart, his very mind, his very life, his very humility, a very holiness, that God, the God of heaven, where he produce Christ in everyone that calls upon him. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. Let's open our mouth as we begin to thank God for his word that has come undiluted. Let's thank God for his grace and unction upon our father. Right from Thursday, yesterday and today, we've been drinking from the fountain of life through him. Let's appreciate God for the entrance of his word that has brought light and understanding to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank and praise your name. We worship you, O God, for your love bestowed upon us by speaking to us as a father 
we speak to his children. In Jesus name we pray. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. The Bible said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thou lovest righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, Lord, even thy God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Wherever we are, I want us to lift our voice unto the Lord. And say, O Lord, my God and my Father, help me to love righteousness and hate anything called iniquity. Remember that Jesus is coming again, but for to rapture a church that is without spot or wrinkle. My sister, pray. My brother, pray. Oh Lord, clothe your church with a garment of righteousness as we await your triumphant return. In the mighty name of Jesus, sir, help us to say no to the dictate of the world to carnality in the mighty name of jesus sir. open your mouth my sister and brother and pray and say oh lord god almighty help me as a person to eschew every form of evil every form of wickedness in the mighty name of jesus sir. father take away malice from my life Take away greed from my life. Ah, Lord, I come to you. You are my helper. Without you, I can do nothing. Help your church. Help your pastors. Help the evangelists. Help the teachers of the word. Lord, help my family. Help your church in the mighty name of Jesus. Sir. Begin to pray Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5, the Bible says, Let this mind which was in Christ Jesus dwell in me richly. Dwell in you richly. Shall we pray and say, O oh Lord, every mind, every heart, contrary to your own, take it away from me, take it away from your church. Pray and say, O oh Lord, remove every stony heart and give me a heart of flesh, a heart to love you, a heart to pray, a heart to evangelize in the mighty name of Jesus, sir. Pray also and say, O oh Lord, clothe me with a garment of humility. The Bible says, Wherefore, God giveth grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Pray and say, O oh Lord, every form of pride in my life, as a pastor, take it away. As an evangelist, take it away. As a businessman, a businesswoman, every form of pomposity, Lord, remove it out of my life, out of your church, in the, gam in the mighty name of Jesus, sir. Oh, Lord, clothe your church with a garment of humility. Clothe me with a garment of humility. Jesus came. He humbled himself, died a shameful death. But later on, the Bible says he was highly exalted. Open your mouth and say, oh God, I desire to be like Jesus. I desire to walk like Jesus. I desire, Paul the Apostle said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Open your mouth and say, Lord Jesus, I desire to know you. Help me to know you more and more. Help your church to know you more and more. In the mighty name of Jesus, sir, take away religious spirit. Uh, take away tradition out of my life, out of your church. In the mighty name of Jesus, sir, uh, open your mouth and say, Oh Lord, set your church on fire. Set your church ablaze, O Lord. Grant us the grace to go out after this retreat in order to begin to win souls in the villages, in the cities, and all over. In the mighty name of Jesus, sir. Open your mouth and say, Lord, grant us passion. Passion for the dying soul. In the mighty name of Jesus, sir. Jesus speaking in the book of John chapter 9 verse 4. 
He said, I must walk the walk of him that sent me while it is still day. For the night is coming when no man can walk again. Oh Lord, baptize your church afresh in Wukari, in Jalingo, in Taraba, in Nigeria, in Africa, and the world at larger for the end time harvest, for the end time walk. Lord, we lean on you. The Bible says, by strength shall no man prevail. Pray and say, Holy Spirit, strengthen me. Strengthen your pastors. Strengthen the evangelists. Strengthen every worker in the vineyard of the Lord. As many that are wearied and tired, Holy Spirit, refresh us. The Bible says, if this power that raises Jesus Christ from the dead, indwells me, indwells you. The same power shall quicken our mortal body. As we round up, begin to pray and say, Father, remove every disorderliness in my life, in my family, and in our church. Every form of disorderliness, Father, remove it, order my life, construct, reconstruct my life, revive me, O oh God, revitalize me by your mighty power. I lean and depend upon you, for by strength shall no man prevail. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Oh Lord, enable your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, it is written in your word. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn away from their wicked ways and seek my face. Oh Lord, you say you will forgive us. And you will bring healing upon our land. We humble ourselves on behalf of the brethren. On behalf of the Christendom. Praying that you forgive us in the mighty name of Jesus. Help us to live a life that is pleasant unto you in the name of Jesus. Clothe us with a garment of humility in the mighty name of Jesus. Send us out as we keep doing your work. Blessed be your name. And the people of God will shout the loudest, Amen. Praise the Lord. Is everybody there? Say, praise the Lord. We are going to take our Bible study immediately. So we just have some few time. When we finish the Bible study, we think of going for rest. So we appreciate those.
Cause Christ is all I need I have no lack Cause Christ is enough for me I have no lack Cause Christ is all I need That you minister to us. You will speak to our hearts. That before we leave this place. On the second. We will never remain the same. Let us pray. Heavenly Father we bless your name for gathering us around your word at this time. You've assured us that it is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. That the words that you speak unto us, they are spirit and they are life. And so we are confident that as it comes to us now, it will be spirit and life unto us in Jesus' name. Open our understanding, O God, and grant us insight into the study of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we come to this Bible study titled Christ's Faithfulness and uh, Conditional Security. Christ's Faithfulness and our Conditional Security. We're reading from Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And as much as he who had built the house had more honor than the house, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things, he that built all things is God. In verse 5, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope? firm unto the end. Those are the six verses that we engage our attention in this Bible study. Once again, it's titled Christ's Faithfulness and Our Conditional Security. Now, the epistle to the Hebrews speaks of the superiority of Christ over angels on one hand and over all humans. Of course, you might say, if he's superior over angels, then it means he will be superior over all humans. But the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews brought out cogent arguments to show to us that this is the case. Now, we are in chapter 3. But before chapter 3, the first two chapters set forth the superiority of Christ over angels, like I said earlier, and then the prophets actually is important to recall that angels were most important to the Jewish religion. Uh, as God gave them the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, you remember that it was mediated by a myriad of angels. So proving to the people here that Christ is superior to the angels is quite an important task. Now, chapter 3 begins with Christ's superiority over Moses. And if you come back to the text we read, it says there in Hebrews 3 from verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. On this matter of faithfulness, 
we find Christ faithful, but also Moses was faithful. As that verse continues, as also Moses was faithful all his house. So then, does it mean that Christ is faithful, Moses is faithful, so they are at par? No, not quite. It then continues in verse 3, for this man was counted worthy, referring to Christ, of more glory than Moses, both faithful, but this one is counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house has more honor than the house. And so we see very clearly that here we are being told and convinced that Christ faithful, like Moses was faithful, but Christ is more faithful or more glorious, is worthy of more glory than Moses. You realize that the character and commission of Moses was quite remarkable. He was devoted to God and was such a gl glowing example of self-sacrifice in a service for Israel. Yet as great as Moses was, Christ far excelled him. And as comparisons go, well, Moses was a man of God, no doubts about that, caught it anyway, he was a man of God. But Christ was God himself. What a contrast. Moses was a prophet to whom God spoke, but then Christ was himself the truth, revealing perfectly the whole mind, will, and heart of God, the Father. Who else can show us, who else can reveal to us the perfect will of the Father than him who has been in the bosom of the Father from eternity? Not only that, Moses delivered Israel from Egypt. What a feat, a remarkable feat at that. But then Christ delivers his people from the bondage of sin and everlasting fire. So we see clearly that Christ was immeasurably superior to Moses in all things. Now, these first three chapters of Hebrews clearly reveal the exalted dignity and unique excellency of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We now focus on the first six verses of chapter three, and we divide the study into four parts. Number one, exhortation to holy brethren. We find that in the very first verse, the opening verse, exhortation to holy brethren. Point number two, exaltation of Christ. For this point, we are going to take the first four verses together, that's verses one to four, as we look at exaltation of Christ, so highly exalted above angels, above even the prophets, and in particular here, we are looking at Moses, a prophet like no other. Then point number three, the example of Moses. We set forth the most faithfulness of Moses as an example, but even then, it doesn't quite measure up to the faithfulness of Christ. And to look at the example of Moses, we'll be concentrating on verse two combined with verse five, and then we'll finish up with point four, enduring to the end, enduring to the end. It's a good thing to make a good start, but then how we finish is very, very important. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning there, there of the Bible says. So we come to that very first point, exhortation to holy brethren. Let's come back to Hebrews chapter three. And from verse one, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. So we see very clearly here that there's reference to holy brethren, but that's not all. We also see a reference to partakers of the heavenly calling. These holy brethren are partakers of the heavenly calling. And so we see very clearly that the exhortation in this verse is addressed to the brethren. And in qualifying them as holy brethren, is simply telling us that these were saved people. These were converted people. These were people who have put their faith in Christ. That's why they are referred to as holy brethren. The moment we come unto the Lord and our sins are forgiven, we receive the righteousness of Christ. We become holy in the sight of God. And right here, we are referred to as holy brethren. Holy brethren, 
because of their divinely transformed character. And we see in the Bible that this is not just the only place where the people of God are referred to as holy brethren in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading here in verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. As the writer to the Hebrews was addressing them as holy brethren, Paul here is also talking to the, I mean, writing to the Thessalonians that this epistle should be read unto all the holy brethren. Holy brethren, those who have put their faith in Christ, those who are born again, those whose sins are forgiven, those who are divinely transformed in their character, their conduct, their attitude, their disposition. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are told, For ye are, but ye are a chosen generation and holy priesthood. A, peculiar nation. So we see the holiness there because they have been saved. Their sins have been forgiven. But they have not only been referred to in that our text, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, as holy brethren. It also refers to them as partakers. What does it mean to be a partaker? To be a sharer. That you are sharing in what the gospel offers to as many as have believed the gospel. The holy brethren are partakers. They are sharers of the heavenly calling and we see that what we share is as much as the gospel has provided every gospel benefit we share in it by virtue of the fact that we are all saved by the grace of the lord jesus christ so we do not only partake of the heavenly callings we see other things that we partake of if we look at uh in uh, colossians chapter 1 and in verse 12 colossians chapter 1 and in verse 12, there we are told, giving thanks unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. There's an inheritance that God has reserved for his saints, as many as have left the kingdom of darkness and have come into the glorious light of the gospel. There is an inheritance that God has reserved for them. And as many as have made that commitment to the Lord, we partake, we share in that inheritance not only that in fact we are told in second peter chapter one second peter chapter one and i'm reading here from verse from verse four second peter chapter one and from verse four whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature what a glorious thing that when we come to the Lord and we are saved, we can actually partake of the nature of God. Everyone that is genuinely saved, everyone that is genuinely converted. But then we see that the exhortation has been so addressed to holy brethren that are partakers of the divine nature. But that's not all. What actually is the exhortation itself? Look at it there in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And in verse 1, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. That is the actual exhortation. Consider the apostle, number one, and then the high priest, number two, of our profession. Now, when we say consider, what do we mean? To consider simply means to thoroughly think of Christ so as to have a full knowledge of him, who he is, what he represents, his office, his person, his work. We must thoroughly ponder on his dignity, his excellency, and authority. This is so critical. This is so important because it is for the want of this that many times we are lukewarm. We are faithless. We are compromising and all the rest. But when we duly consider, when we take to heart, when we give serious thought to who Christ is, who he was, and all he represents to us, it's very difficult to become a wishy-washy Christian. It's very difficult to be somebody that just meanders at the slightest opposition. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 3, talking about 
consider, consider that we need to really consider Jesus Christ so that we'll be able to run the race as we ought to. Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 3, it says, For consider him, that's the word, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. You see, if we fail to consider, we will draw by this wayside. We will take a spiritual detour. But then, if we duly consider, then we are able to carry on in the race. And the Lord himself will continue to strengthen us, even for the race in Jesus' name. Consider, consider in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle having painted, you know, the picture of what a servant of God ought to be, a good soldier, you see, a resolute athlete, if an indefatigable farmer. He now come, got to this verse, then we say, consider what I say. Consider all the symbols and representations that I've given you of the Christian, you know, worker, of the Christian minister. Consider what I say. As you take each of those symbols one by one and you duly consider them, you will see what I'm trying to pass across to you. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So I believe that the Lord will help us to duly consider who Christ is, the apostle and the high priest of our possession. I pray the Lord of our profession. I pray the Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. Brethren, it is important to be faithful and to be consistent. And the only way to do that is to consider Christ. Meditate on him often. Meditate on who and what he is and fix your eyes on him in all circumstance of life. The Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. We quickly come to the second point, exaltation of Christ. Exaltation of Christ. We go back to Hebrews chapter 3, and now we are going to take the first four verses together. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading from verse, from verse 1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That's the person, the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man, Christ Jesus, for this man, the apostle and high priest of her profession, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. What a revelation. Every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Exaltation of Christ. So we see clearly here, Christ is referred to first as the apostle, and then secondly, as the high priest of our profession. Let's focus on Christ as the apostle. As the apostle, what does that word apostle, what does it mean? It means one sent forth of God, endowed with authority as the ambassador of the Most High God. And that is exactly who Jesus was. Notice that apostle there, capital A, is the apostle of all apostles. He's the apostle that gave the fivefold ministry to the church, beginning with apostles. He is the one that appointed all of them. He is the one that was sent forth as the guide light, as the leading apostle from whom every other apostle must take cue. So Christ in scriptures was frequently known as the sent one. Let's just see a few references in the Bible confirming to us that Christ is the sent one. The apostle in John's gospel chapter 3, we find John the Baptist as was giving his defense there, people wanting to pitch them together, that you come uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, I mean, first before this man. You actually pointed this man out. Look at it. Everybody is going after him. John says, make no mistake about it. I have fulfilled my job by pointing out to you that that is the Messiah. And as John was, you know, presenting his arguments here in verse 34 of John chapter 3, he now added here, for him whom God has sent, 
that's referring to Jesus Christ. For him who God, whom God has sent, speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So Christ is the sent one. John said that much, but what has Christ to say himself about his apostleship? About the fact that he was the sent one. Look at chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm looking at it here in verse 42. John chapter 8. And in verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he, referring to God, he, the father, sent me. Christ is the sent one. And we can go through several I mean, references, John 5, 36, John chapter 6 verse 29 but look at chapter 10 verse 36 again john chapter 10 and in verse 36 look at the word of god the saint one it says here say ye of him whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world so we see very clearly that christ was the saint one the saint of the father and now as the saint one of the father the general function of christ as the apostle was to make known the will of God, the will of his Father. And as he makes known the will of his Father unto us, we have just one responsibility. We have a singular duty, which is simply to hear him. Hear him. God himself directed that everyone should listen to this sent one, to this apostle of our profession. Look at Matthew chapter 17. At the Mount of Transfiguration, as the disciples witness the transfiguration of their Lord, and Peter made that request that, can we make three tabernacles here and all the rest? The Lord spoke. He says here in Matthew 17 from verse 5, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What's the conclusion? Hear ye him. That's what God the Father is saying, that we should listen to Christ. Actually, even in the Old Testament, when Moses was speaking to the people, he made it clear that a prophet was going to come after him, that the Lord himself will raise up unto them. And he told them very clearly that that is the one to listen to. That one we have, he has the final say in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, reading here from verse 15, the Lord thy God we raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. From amongst you, he will raise up a prophet of thy brethren like unto me. There will be circumstances of the raising up of this, of this prophet that will be very similar to my own raising up. The birth of Moses, when you look at the you know, dangerous time he was born, how that the Pharaoh then has already said they should kill every male child born to the, you know, to the Hebrews. You remember even Herod, he wanted to kill baby Jesus. And there are so many similarities we can, we can draw. A prophet like unto me. It says, unto him ye shall hearken. Hear ye him. That's our duty. As he reveals the will of God to us, we have a responsibility to obey, to respond to his voice. Look at verse 18 here, Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet. Here's the almighty God promising them through Moses. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and we put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whomsoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. In other words, we must listen to this prophet, this apostle that the Lord is going to send to us. But then he was not only referred to in our text as the apostle, he was also referred to as the high priest of our profession. Let's focus on that a little bit. The high priest of our profession. What do we learn from that? Of course, it is obvious that as the high priest is a merciful and faithful high priest. That's what we are told in the earlier chapter, chapter 2, and in verse 17, Hebrews chapter 2, reading here from verse, from verse 17. It says here in verse 17, wherefore in all things it behoved him to be, to be made like unto his brethren, 
that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. A merciful. How we need such an high priest, full of mercy. A merciful high priest, a faithful high priest, faithful to everything that the Lord requires of him in things pertaining to God. And we see very clearly that Christ as the apostle, he's God's representative to his people. But as the high priest, he is her representative before God. So this dual role, this dual function is so important because they balance each other. The apostle, he speaks to us from God. The high priest, he speaks to God for us. And this is very, very important. And we are told that he was faithful to him that appointed him faithful to him that appointed him and is worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, if we come to the issue of faithfulness, how important, how significant that a man is faithful. When God appoints us and when God gives us a responsibility, a task, he is looking for that key thing, that faithfulness, faithfulness. Now, faithfulness uh, signifies two things. Number one is a trust committed a trust committed that's one and then number two it's a proper discharge of that trust very very important we cannot substitute one for the other it has to be one after the other a trust committed and then a proper discharge of that trust and as we look at our lord and savior jesus christ what a faithful high priest what a faithful high priest jesus christ had a trust committed to him and he faithfully discharged it. All the way to Calvary, he went for us. Christ's concern from beginning to the end was to be faithful to the one that appointed him. You remember in John's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 4, he told those people, he said, I must walk the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. It's very important for us that we understand the place of faithfulness in everything that we are doing for God. Because for want of faithfulness, our service will be completely, totally disqualified. Come back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, I pick it up from verse 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house had more honor than the house. In verse 4, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. He that built all things is God. Now those two verses make it very, very clear that Christ is superior to Moses. And as God that built all things, of course, Moses built the tabernacle of the congregation in the Old Testament. And the Lord warned repeatedly, make sure you build it according to the specific specification shown to you on the mount. The pattern shown to you but then do you see Christ? Christ is actually son over the house. He is not building as, you know, the servant like Moses. No, he is a son over the house itself. So we see very clearly that Christ is presented as superior to Moses. And indeed, he's superior to Moses. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 3. John chapter 1 and from verse 3, it says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The import of all that the writer to the Hebrews is getting at here about Christ is actually that he is not just a human being. He is actually God. That's the essence of what he is getting across to us, that Christ is not just a human being, yes, very much a human being but very much god as well and we need to take that to heart so that once we come to an understanding of that we see that that's where the comparison of faithfulness ends moses as a man and then god that became man in colossians chapter 1 colossians chapter 1 reading here in verse 16 it says for by him were all things created. You couldn't say that about Moses. For by him were all things created. Even the tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness, he needed a pattern shown him 
or else he wouldn't know what to be. For by him were all things created, referring to Christ, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invincible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Exaltation of Christ, very God and very man. We've seen the exaltation to holy brethren, We've seen the exaltation of Christ far above every throne or dominion or any name that is named. Now we want to look at the example of Moses because there is something we can learn from Moses, though far, 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 far inferior to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are still lessons we can learn from that man. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. We are now going to combine verse 2 and verse 5. Who was faithful to him that appointed him? That's still referring to Jesus. But now here comes the reference to Moses. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now one will be forgiven to think that the Lord is saying they are equal. That Jesus was faithful. Moses was faithful. Yes, to some extent. On the count of faithfulness, there's a comparison. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house. Follow this as a servant as a servant. That qualifies the faithfulness of Moses as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Testimony of those things which are to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house. You see, Christ owns the house. Moses is just a builder. Plus Moses and what he's building Everything belongs to Christ. So we see very clearly that here we are pointed to the example of the faithfulness of Moses. Very, very important. I think he's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 or so in verse 2 that it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Talking about the faithfulness of Moses, we have to go as far back as Numbers chapter 12 and see the Lord commending the faithfulness of his servant. When most, uh, Miriam and Aaron, the older brother and sister, felt there was something to speak disparagingly about him, God summoned them out and said, how come you are not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? But in the course of that discussion, see what the Lord revealed about his servant Moses. Numbers chapter 12 and in verse 7, my servant Moses is not so. My servant Moses is not so. I declare, I reveal myself, I make my message known to prophets and those of you that have appointed prophetesses. I have clear ways of communicating with you by dreams, by visions, by, you know, dark speeches and all the rest. But as for Moses, no, it's not like that. My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all my house? That's a reference right there. Who is faithful in all my house? With him will I speak mouth to mouth. But the point is that God attested to the faithfulness of Moses. And what a challenge to you. What a challenge to me. That whatever God has appointed us, given us to do, that we make sure that we are faithful to God in everything, in discharging that responsibility. Moses was faithful in all his house. What house are we referring to? Are we talking about, uh, you know, a physical building or something like that? No. That house there, that term house, actually refers to a family. The house of Israel in particular, all that God gave Moses to do as leader of his people, he was faithful in discharging his responsibility. God was talking about the faithfulness to Moses in, you know, fulfilling all that he commanded him, even for their welfare, the descendants of Israel, the children of Israel. That is the house being referred to there. Moses was faithful to God in all his responsibilities. He was faithful to God in everything that God assigned him to do. He never withheld a word which the Lord had given him. Either from Pharaoh, maybe scared of Pharaoh, I couldn't go to that man, is such a terror. No, no. Every time God says, go again, meet Pharaoh, he's on the way to the river. Meet Pharaoh, go and tell him, say to him, let my people go. 
He never reneges on that. He is always faithful. He will go and speak to Pharaoh. Not only that, whatever word God has given him for Israel, even though they may almost stone him at times and things like that, no, he will still go and speak to them exactly what the Lord has bidden him to. And when you think about the construction of the tabernacle of the congregation, think about the details of it. Think about that monumental task. It took faithfulness on the part of Moses. But that by the time it was read up, I think in Exodus chapter 40 or, or so, the Bible said they have done it exactly as the Lord prescribed. Little wonder the cloud of the Shekinah glory came down upon that place as evidence that God is well pleased with what has been done. Faithful in all my house. He built everything according to the pattern that he received on the mount. And the lesson to you and to me, the challenge to every one of us is that we should be faithful in like manner. That we should be faithful just like Moses was faithful. You know there are people who believe um, to be, they, will, they will be faithful if only they can be given one massive huge task or oh, they are going to be faithful. But you know this little thing I'm doing here, that one doesn't task me. That one is going, not going to bring out the gem of faithfulness that is inside me. The Bible doesn't agree with that. No. Faithfulness is where it begins with the little, little things that we are doing. Because if in the little, little things we are doing, think about somebody who is a house fellowship leader. And he's not bothered about getting in touch with anybody to even find out about their welfare and things like that. And he's saying this house fellowship of 15 people, this house fellowship of 20 people. When I have a district, when I have a congregation of 200 people, oh, come and see faithfulness at that time. No, it doesn't work like that. Look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. Luke, chapter 16, I'm reading here in verse 10. Luke, chapter 16. And in verse 10, here the Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least. The little, little things that we have to do. The little, little assignments that we have been given to carry out. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. When you think about that great apostle, Paul, do you know one of the things that stood him out is his faithfulness to everything that God wanted him to do. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient. That's an aspect of faithfulness. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Let's see his testimony. In 1 uh, Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading there from verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, and from verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful. He counted me faithful. Paul is making it clear that one of the reasons Jesus put me in the ministry is because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. If I skip to verse 16, he then added there, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern, for an example to them which will hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. As we come unto the Lord and we are saved, we are saved to serve. And in rendering that service unto the Lord, it is required that we are found faithful. I pray the Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. We have seen the exhortation to holy brethren and then we've considered the exhortation of Christ above angels, now above prophets represented by Moses. Now we have also seen the example of Moses to challenge us that yes, as Moses was faithful, we also are required to be faithful in everything that the Lord has appointed us to do. We need to be faithful. Is essential, is indispensable that we are found faithful or else we are disqualified from the ministry. But then I want to go to this conclusion of the verses we are considering in this Bible study. Let's come back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, there's something here that is really important for us. And I'm just going to read through those six verses again to refresh your mind. Wherefore, holy brethren, 
partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Always think about him. Always consider him. Always meditate on him, who he was, what he is to us. Consider him who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house for this man, Christ Jesus. For this man, our blessed Redeemer, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house has more honor than the house. In verse 4, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. For a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house, that's the superiority, as a son, over his own, Moses as a servant. He now says, whose house are we? If we hold fast, if we hold fast, we need to mark that two-letter word, if. If we hold fast, that if should have been made probably in capital IF because it's so significant, it's so important. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the home firm unto the end. So we are finishing up with enduring to the end. Enduring to the end. It's not enough to start the Christian race. It's not enough to say yes to Jesus and say it probably in a spectacular fashion. Like we have that of Paul the Apostle. All that will count for nothing if we end up backsliding, if we end up in apostasy, we need to endure to the very end. Look at verse 14 of that same Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and in verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. We are made sharers. We are going to share of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You see again, if it's not just taken for granted, oh, that because by the grace of God I gave my life to the Lord 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, but by the time the trumpet sounds, I've gone back to the far country. By the time the trumpet, and, and you know some people will say, but God will have to consider how long I was there and how much labor I bestowed. Even though now I'm no longer, there's nothing like that. Everything is burnt up in ashes. It's gone. It's gone. And so it is important for us that we maintain that constancy, that consistency, that steadfastness unto the very end. Or else, things will not fit, will go well for us. It will, not be nice, it will not be good with us if we do not finish our race still abiding in the faith. It's so much important that we are continuing in the Lord and we are holding fast our profession to the very end. That is very, very important. There are people these days who tell us that no, once you are saved, that's it. You are forever saved. They say, you tell me. If you give birth to a child and then the child uh, became nasty, so will you disown the child? Will you throw the child into hot water, for example, and say because he didn't? You see, they, they do not understand the mind of God when it comes to the salvation of a soul. The Lord said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And once we have been saved from sin, we must keep away from sin. To the very end, if the Lord comes and we have gone back like the pig, you know, back to it, you know, wallowing in the mire, that will not stand us in good stead at all. We'll find ourselves on the wrong side of the divide. So we see that Christ is his son over the house of God. Whose house are we? If. Whose house are we? If. And that's a significant if. You see, the, the house is a spiritual house. It's not a physical thing. And it's made up of believers in Christ. 
Every member of the body of Christ will come into the body by being saved by grace through faith. That's it. We are the house being referred to, the spiritual house. The brethren that were referred to in verse 1 as partakers of the heavenly calling, as well as members of the spiritual family or household of God, we are the house that are being referred to here that Christ is a son over his own house. And we remain part of that house. We remain part of that spiritual building so long as we are still abiding in the faith. If we take a detour, if we go on a spiritual detour, unfortunately, there's no provision for that. So that when we talk about the believer's security, the believer is as secured as he is in Christ. If he goes outside Christ, if he backslides, uh, let's uh, not mind all this. Uh, you know, some people are more loving than God. So they say that even if God says this, we know God. He's a faithful God. He's a loving father. There is no way he's ever going to allow any of his children. Once you have said yes to Jesus, that is it. It's finished now. You can never go to hell again. Really? The Bible doesn't support that. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 3. We read it. Let's read it again. Hebrews chapter 3 and from verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? If, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. Firm unto the end. It then added in verse 14, which I read, let's read it again. For we are made partakers of Christ. If, that's the word again, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. It's not this man that started so well and he, he, he ran so well, his feet are swift as as hell. But then the point is that along the road he took a wrong turn. He decided to go on a spiritual detour. That is not, that, that's the end of the road for that man because it is required that we continue consistently unto the end. Hear the word of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and in verse 31. John chapter 8 and in verse 31. It says there, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Good a thing they believed. But you know it doesn't stop at that. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, it's important for them to take this message to heart. And what did he say? If ye continue in my word, continuity. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. What is the implication of that? If they turn back, if they say away with this man, if they say this is an hard saying, who can hear this? And they go away. Then are they still saved? But you see, the eternal security people tell us that, yes, even when they abandon Christ, they are still saved. Uh-uh. The Bible doesn't support that. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That means if you don't continue, you've lost your, you know, discipleship. No, you've lost that tag. You've lost, you know, that name. Disciple. No, it doesn't apply to you any longer. Why? Because you've turned back from following from continuing in my word look at colossians chapter one colossians chapter one and you see all over scriptures that this uh, doctrine of eternal security holds no water whatsoever no not at all colossians chapter one and in verse 23 there we are told if ye continue do you see that again if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled Grounded and settled. This fellow was here. He was sitting down right here. Settled. You know, consistent. Then all of a sudden, he couldn't be found anymore. They say, well, so, oh, he, uh, he has gone back to his former trade. He's gone. That's the end of the road for such a person. If he continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which he have had, and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven. It's important that we continue to the very end, not to a great length of the distance, not to a great way of the distance. No, we must last the entire distance. That is what the Lord is saying to us. Look at it again in the 
actually in the Old Testament is quite interesting that this same fact of continuity, steadfastness, is so clearly stated, so clearly taught in the Old Testament. Here was uh, David, aged David, uh, admonishing Solomon, his son. And he was very clear with his son. He made it so plain so that Solomon couldn't say, I, I, I don't quite get that, no. It was, it was laid plain on the table. And whoever reads it will run. We it, it, you, it, you get a clear understanding of what this man of God was telling his son in uh, First Chronicles chapter 28. Look at that. First Chronicles 28 and in verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, what will happen? Oh, he will say, please don't forsake me. If you leave me, I will be lonely. Uh -uh, nothing like that. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, what will happen? He will cast thee off forever. He will cast the Old Testament. He will cast thee off forever. That's what will happen. Is that just David? Look at it also in Second Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles 15. And you see that the balanced teaching of God's word is that there's nothing like, you know, uh, 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 eternal, you know, security. That once somebody says forever, no, no, you are saved as you continue with the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse, from verse 2. Second Chronicles 15. And from verse 2, look at what the king, you know, the prophet that went to speak to the, to the king. He says, And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. Why ye be with him? And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, if ye forsake him, what will happen? He will forsake you. Show me that man that God has forsaken. And I will show you a man that forsook God. That is how it works. But some people want us to believe, oh no, we can forsake God. They will still be running after. You know, there are some, <laughs> there are some worship songs we sing. They are very lovely. But when you look at the Bible critically, you wonder, is this really true? Is this really true? One man is not interested in God. He cannot be bothered. He's forsaking God. He's just going his own way. But God is just running after that man. Running after, really? Well, David told Solomon, if you forsake God, he will forsake you. Prophet Oded told Asa, the king of Judah, and Benjamin said, if you forsake God, he will forsake you. You remember what happened in the matter of the golden calf, the molten calf that Israel made. When Moses was gone up to receive the law, and he came back and saw them dancing around that abomination, he broke the table. He has just collected from, he broke the table of the commandments right at the bottom there. And then he called Aaron, what is this that you have done? At the end of it all, he wanted to make intercession for the people. He said, God, blot me out of your book. If you will not forgive these people, they are your people that you brought out of Egypt. God says, yes, I understand, but I don't blot people like, oh, God blots people. He said, yes, I do. Yes, I do, but I don't do it that way. I only blot out those who have seen that. I wonder where some theologians are reading because it's clear. Look at it, Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, because you must have to employ some hermeneutical slate of hand to interpret this otherwise. It says here in Second Chronicles, I'm sorry, Exodus, Exodus chapter 32. Let's read there from verse 33. Exodus 32 and from verse 33. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin. And have made them goals. I mean, sorry, I'm reading from verse 31 rather. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin. And have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou will forgive their sin. Right? You see a dash. That's Moses' request. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Wait, Moses, 
Does God blot people out of the book? Say yes, he does. He does. Blot me out of the book, of thy book, which thou hast written. But look at the reply. The Lord didn't say, oh, Moses, that's an error of, you know, judgment. No, I don't blot people like that. I'm a loving God. I'm a holy God. Once you come to me, that's the end of the matter. You can live whichever way you like. You can even forsake me and go to the far country on holidays and then come back when you please. Mm. Look at it there, verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, don't listen to those theologians. They don't know what they are talking about. Listen to the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. May the Lord have mercy upon us. You see, we need to understand. We need to understand the mind of God and stop following all these cheap, you know, theologians that uh, they want to give people license to live anyhow. And then God will still take them over to heaven. No, God is demanding of us steadfastness that we follow him consistently. All believers are here reminded of the need to remain steadfast to God to the end of our pilgrimage. We must not give up on our faith. We must not diminish in our consecration and faithfulness in times of temptation and persecution. No, we should remain steadfast and consistent. We must always remember that the Lord himself told those Jewish believers, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Because if we don't continue, we run the risk of missing eternal life. Matthew's Gospel chapter 10. We'll read a few more scriptures and we are going to pray. Matthew chapter 10, look at it here in verse 22. Matthew 10 from verse 22. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel. The son, sorry, that's verse 23 I'm reading. Sorry, verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He that endureth to the end. It's important that we endure to the end if we are to receive the final salvation. Chapter 24 and in verse 13. Matthew 24 verse 13. If we back up to verse 12, it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. How much do we need to? Jesus said that's the case. And all these people that are saying they have eternal security, Jesus doesn't agree with them. Jesus said there's the need to endure to the end. Let's finish up with Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 23. Hebrews 10. And from verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works. If I skip to verse 35, in verse 35 we are told, Hebrews 10 from verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence. Don't throw it away. Keep it. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. If you look at verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. What is going on? What is happening? Intense persecution terrible temptation, whatever it is. The just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, if any man draw back, if any man backslides, my soul shall have no pleasure. It can't be plainer than that. That's plain English. My soul shall have, come up with whatever excuse you have for drawing back. It will not hold water. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Do you understand one thing here? Drawing back is only to perdition. There's nothing else. We will not draw back. I say we will not draw back. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We have a present aspect of our salvation. We've given our lives to the Lord and we are still following him. But there's a final aspect of our salvation where Christ will meet us when he comes back. Or where death will meet us. Are we going to be the dead in Christ 
or the dead outside Christ. This is very important for us, that the Lord will only save those that remain in the faith to the very end of their life. Not that they did so well, not that they tried, they came a long way, no. Because drawing back is unto perdition. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise on our feet and talk to the Lord. There's much grounds we have covered in this Bible study, and we just want to go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, help us to be true to our heavenly calling as holy brethren. Holy brethren. What a signification, holy brethren. What a label, holy brethren. Brethren who have embraced holiness by reason of the fact that their sins are forgiven. They've given their lives unto the Lord. Their names are in the book of life. And they are partakers of the heavenly calling. What a privilege. Now we need to balance privilege with responsibility. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord. The exhortation has come to you as a holy brethren. The exhortation of Christ, the example of Moses, and then the need to endure to the end. Talk to the Lord.
Stress when nothing makes sense, I find you. Cause Christ is all I need I have no lack Cause Christ is enough for me I have no lack Cause Christ is all I need
Oh uh-huh. 